Yes, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Larry. Welcome, everybody. And also, thank you, Galen, for putting this together for us. Uh, he's going to have a slideshow presentation for about 60 different slides and a lot of info along the way. Uh, Galen is a 34 plus year Belden engineer and principal product engineer. He is uh, uh, the founder of Iconoclast. And it's a product of Belden Cable, which is a 119 year old company here in wire and cable company in the USA. Everything they manufacture is 100% made in the USA and manufactured and shipped from Blue Jeans Cable up in Seattle, Washington. So we're going to learn about how cables and different uses of cables work. All right, then, Galen, welcome and thank you for being here. OK, thank you. Now my uh, presentation disappeared when you flipped over. I is see there, the screen is changed, it, yes. Yeah, Let's is there a reason go for to that? Galen view. How did I have that? You have to just reshare. Try sharing. Uh, I got some, yeah, I got the, I don't know what happened. Do I have to reshare it? Let's see. Let's I try that. Did go. that work? Yep. Yes, we're there. Okay, yeah. okay good. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, Iconoclast was sort of an accident. And towards the end of my career at Belden, which spanned 35 years, we generally do things, well, you know, just called blue sky experiments, where if you get a wild hair up your butt, your management thinks you know enough to be dangerous, they figure maybe the guy will figure out how to make gunpowder, we can do something with that. So they sort of let me loose. And Unfortunately, they said, well, Galen, why are you picking a product that's been laying dormant for 50 years? Nobody seems to think there's a problem with audio cables. And I said, well, with the development of high-speed digital, there's a lot of technology that uh, I've uncovered and kind of put off to the side over the years that could actually make cable that measure better to basic scientific principles. And they said, well, as long as it's really better and you can measure it and calculate it and prove it, we don't have a problem with you making it. The problem is, after you do prove it's better, does it really work better in an application? In other words, was good enough, technically still good enough. And I was using Belden 1313A, 1694A, like a lot of you guys. And I decided, let's see what can happen with these cables if I truly, really, honestly make a better cable. In other words, no mystical stuff that I can't prove, no theories, you know, none of that stuff. Just honest to God, straight up engineered, figure out what make these cables work and try to basically take each attribute and just kind of push it along down the road and make it honestly as good as I possibly can, listen to it and see if it sounds better. The project was supposed to convince me to not worry about cable anymore mm -hmm. and that better was better and I'd be an audioholics website devotee and say nothing can be better than a pair of 1313A and 1694A connection leads. Turned out to have happened just the opposite. When I put these things in my system it was like, oh my God, you know, I'm, you're, I'm not taking them out. And I was kind of embarrassed about it at first because I didn't want to tell the guys at work that they really sounded this good because they think I was nuts because they, of course, thought that it wasn't going to turn out like it did. Well, I had several people over and listened. And I said that, and they said, there's definitely sounds different. I said, now, here's the thing, guys. Is it better different or different different? And I said, I really just want, to want you to tell me that the cables do sound differently because that in itself is significant to me that if you do change the way the cables are built and measured and made, they do have a different sound. And an audiophile, of course, is going to pick the one that they think is the most enjoyable. And I explained to them that that basically is what this market is, is trying to pick products that actually sound more neutral than something they had been previously using, which might vary from person to person. I said, but nonetheless, we have a product that's been done strictly based on the engineering that does offer a unique sound that to me is very nice. Uh, maybe we should try to do something with this. And they looked at the market and long story short, they said, Galen, this is way too techy and complex for what we're really set up to do. It would take a whole nother company to do this. And I said, well, how about I quit work, retire. We go to Blue Jeans, Belden makes the cable, Blue Jeans makes the assemblies and we sell them. So it'll basically be a class by Belden manufactured and distributed by Blue Jeans Cable. So that's kind of where we are today. Uh, Aaron, can so you I get your video on? Oops. Let's see. Now? Yes, thank you. There we go. Okay. Well, I don't know why it keeps turning off. And the, But, oh, well, 
at Zoom. But, uh, so, so that's kind of where we are today is we ended up with a product that works exceptionally well and it follows all standard engineering practices to make it, which is a little unusual. Uh, so Belden gave the green light to go ahead and manufacture the product as long as, quote, we sold it based on its performance and didn't come up with some cock and bull story about how it sounds in two or three pages of saying a bunch of nothing about, you know, the esoterics of audio cable, which we don't. We're very factual on Blue Jean's site. Uh, and we basically advertise the specs. As a matter of fact, every assembly you buy from us will be measured for RLNC. So you can see that we made what we promised you. How it works in a system depends on your amp and your speakers, which we'll find out during a presentation why all this happens. And we'll also see why audio cables are really weird things when you really start to analyze how they work or in essence really don't work in our favor by moving a signal from A to B. They're actually pretty bad guys. Uh, so there's a lot of things about them that's very bizarre. And I'm fortunate that the effects are as minimal as they are actually after investigating this. But we'll go through this in the presentation one thing at a time. And we'll start to form an opinion of what we think we're really hearing when we hear differences in cable because the cable is kind of like tomato soup, it's all in there. Sometimes the smallest ingredient can have the biggest effect. It's really hard to pull it apart and say, this is what's, what we're hearing, this is not what we're hearing, so on and so forth. Uh, I have my hunch about what we're hearing and what led to the design of the cables, and I'll, be, I'll express that with you when we get to it. Uh, but there's definitely some things in the cable that can be corrected that weren't looked at. As a matter of fact, we have patents on all three designs based on some of the things that I've done to try to improve these cables. Uh, all cable designers, by the way, work with what I'm gonna talk about today. So I really don't want you to think about this as a presentation on my cable. This is a presentation on all of our audio cables and how they work. The only thing I'm using my cables for is to give you an example of how a designer might decide to manage these particular attributes that aren't really that great and how to make them better. But they all have to do it, assuming that they are, they are doing it. Now you can certainly make the cable and not do anything, but your better vendors out there that have the nicer cables definitely are looking at all the same kind of things I am. So none of this uh, should be new to them. Uh, so there's, no, there's, not gonna be, there's not gonna be any great discoveries here. I might, it might be new information, but I, I can't say it's really a quote discovery. How you manage it and work with it and the compromises you make, that can be patentable and uniquely done, okay? But the attributes that we're working with are shared and struggled with by everybody, okay? So uh, so that's kind of the background of the product. So going to the presentation, all right? You know, basically the first thing I did in this project was made a bunch of prototype samples. And kind of what it boiled down to is my underlying problem was, well, what do we know and how do we order that in a fashion that suits our ears. In other words, what's the most critical aspects of the design that really seems to be providing the most sound for the dollar? What is that? How can I reach it? How can I design around it? And does it even exist? Now, you know, the joke of course is get your ducks in a row. I found out early on, cable is not a straight line development. You don't start at number one and go to two to three to four to five and get to wherever and you're done. It's more like a Mobius strip. If you know what those are, you just take a strip of paper and put a twist in it, put the ends together. And if you put your finger on it and loop around it, you'll find out that it's a continuous path. There's never a beginning and there's never an end. It just kind of loops around. Unfortunately, cables are like this in that you could actually start to explain how a cable works. And I could start anywhere in that Mobius strip and it will loop right back around to where you started again. So in other words, it's sort of a continuous and totally interrelated process because everything you do affects everything else in the cable. And that's where this question of balance comes from on these products. Now, like I said, they are patented, okay? And patented, I mean, of course, is what corporations like to do with unique ideas. Uh, and some of this stuff was unique enough that the lawyer said, you know, as much as we may not use this directly right now, it is worth getting a patent on it because what has happened with these products and what we've done is pretty remarkable and remarkable in a sense that they really do do it from a calculation and mathematical and measurement standpoint. So my joke about this product is if it, if it can't measure better, how on earth can it ever sound better? Uh, that was the big thing uh, is to truly do it from an engineering standpoint. Now, 
lot of the people in the hi-fi stores in the area I talked to about cable said, well, your biggest shortfall, Galen, is you're trying to do it based on the engineering. Everybody knows that can't work. Uh, I personally, to myself, prove that's not true. And then if you do design to the fundamentals properly, those tertiary elements that we like to talk about that can't be proven one way or another, I really can't believe that those don't perform better if basic R, L, and C, and BP linearity, and all these other things are done correctly. So in other words, a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. So my argument is, hey, if you can't measure it, certainly make sure the vehicle it's put on is top notch or else you're not gonna see the advance of a better rubber tire if you don't put it on a race car kind of a thing. So I'm not of the adage that you can ignore RL and see if you have some magic metal or some magic plastic or a special cotton or whatever. My attitude is if you don't use that material, even if it's better in the absolute best, honestly well-known and designed product, you're not gonna get the benefit from it like you should. Now, the product line consists of several different kinds of constructions. The speaker cable is an entirely different electromagnetic problem than the RCA or the XLR. So my other problem is I had to develop three electromagnetically different products and do them all extremely well, or at least to, to what I felt was the industry level level of performance. Uh, the RCA and the XLR were particularly difficult to do because I wanted to make the cables reactively the same. In other words, if you do an impedance and phase plot of an RCA and an XLR, I wanted those two cables to be identical. I didn't want to take, make two different sounding products. I just wanted to make two different designs. No one else has done that in the audio industry. And I've often wondered, why would you not do that? Uh, one's single-ended, one's balanced, but why would you not make the cables reactively the same? And my two products definitely are reactively the same. All right, so, and we'll get to a slide where I can explain that. Now, there's a ton of stuff that you can look at on cables. This is only a partial list of stuff between inductance, capacitance, phase shift, skin effect, velocity, impedance, coherence, all these things. And there's a whole bunch more than this, guys. We could sit here and we could add to this list forever. So there's a lot of different properties you can look at, but the minute you look at one, I guarantee you it will thread through every single other property on the list. Because again, a cable is a completely balanced and interrelated object. There's nothing in a cable that works separate from any other uh, variable in the cable. They're all dependent variables. And that's what makes cable design actually so difficult is you can't ignore L to go after C and R. You can't ignore R and ignore L and C, so on and so forth. All three variables plus many others are all interrelated. Now, this is just one sheet that was done for the speaker cable. You don't really have to see it. That's why I purposely didn't make it well, legible. The idea, though, is to say, hey, you know, <laughs> nobody's perfect. Look at all the different iterations. And this is just one sheet. This is just a speaker cable and one of the sheets that was done during the project. There was a lot, a lot, a lot of work and trial and error done to try to get R, L, and C to balance where I thought it needed to be and to come up with a design that would actually do it. Uh, so to sit there and think that somebody just made these cables real quickly and we're out to just take advantage of audio files. Uh, no, I spent two years working on this project, uh, partly in my basement at home, almost full time, right along with my regular job, as a matter of fact, because it got to be so intense that my boss said, look, you're going to have to do some of this stuff off site. You're, it's getting in the way of 10G, Ethernet cable development, all these other projects. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff it's done to design these cables. Uh, Alan, can you, you um, can you describe to the non-engineers R, L, and C, and what this slide shows here that you put together? Yeah, just quickly. yeah, sure. R, L, and C is just engineering verniculum for resistance, inductance, and capacitance. Those are the three fundamental properties, so to speak, of electronic circuits. Is R, L, and C now? What this chart shows is I purposefully made variations in the electromagnetic design that controls our LNC and done various measurements to see what those effects were, okay? Some of these designs are very complex and everybody thinks engineers can calculate everything. 
but we can't. Some of this stuff is so complex that the only way to find out what the final L and C is in a design is to actually just physically make it and measure it because cable is a lot more complex than measuring just a, a bolt component, for instance, where you can get a little more of an idea of what it's going to be if you model it. Modeling electromagnetic waves in more than a simple couple of conductors is very, very difficult. You get an idea, but I, I didn't need an idea. I needed the absolute best, and that means I have to measure it. Uh, so I'm at the point of, I have to know. I can't kind of know. Uh, we're not selling you kind of knows, so to speak. I, and I was selling this to myself when I did this project. I wasn't selling it or even intended to sell it on the open market at, at all. I was just striving for the very best design that there possibly could be. So these are all separate builds and separate measurements. Yeah, those are all separate builds, separate measurements. And as a matter of fact, not a single one of those on that sheet made the cut. Wow. Just to give you an idea. Uh, so lots and lots of work done to, you know, uh, you know, when you decide to try to truly make something measure better, you have a bar that you have to get over. You can't finagle your way out of it by saying you found a special copper or a special this or a special that. We can't explain why it works, but I listen to it and it's great, so buy it. I have a measurable standard that I have to meet that I have to prove is legit. And that makes life uh, pretty tough, you know, if you're actually trying to do things from an engineering perspective. And that's why a lot of people said you're crazy to do this after 50 years. Why don't you just leave this, leave it lie? Nobody's bothering Belden to make better cable. There's no reason for it. As a matter of fact, most people said Belden doesn't know how to make a better audio cable. We don't understand this market. Uh, as a matter of fact, it turns out, I think we understand it a lot better than most people do based on my 35 years of developing digital and other types of cable. And I've taken that and applied it to audio cables and it's worked really, really well as a matter of fact. So it's, it can develop really good sounding cables uh, that are worthy of your attention and you know, give them a try. Now, one of the words you'll hear used all the time, we all like to say the word coherence, right? Everybody raise your hand, because we do. What does coherence mean when I use it? To me, coherence is the very first sentence and the very first definition in there, the quality of being logical and consistent. All right, so when I talk about coherence in this presentation, that's what I'm, that's how I'm using it, okay? In other words, does something seem consistent and logical the way that it's being implemented across the frequency range? Is it the same, in other words? Now, the problem is our audio cables aren't the same across the frequency range. We're in a really awkward electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to DC where a lot of equations and calculations become what are called indeterminate. In other words, frequency goes to zero. When the frequency goes to zero, we need to create a whole nother group of equations to describe what's happening. The minute we put F in there, frequency, now we have a whole bunch of equations, okay, that are on the other side of that uh, situation describing what happens when we start to modulate AC electricity. And that's when all the inconsistencies start to come into play. Now, the first thing everybody argues about with audio cables definitely is skin depth, okay? Do we have skin depth at audio? We definitely do. The argument is is it sufficient that it's really impacting what we hear when we use the cable? I chose to look at this a little differently. I said, you know, I'm not really interested in the argument of what we can hear right now or what attribute is what we're hearing. My primary focus was to make everything else about the cables better. And through calculation, I can definitely show when you use a smaller conductor, skin depth and what's called current efficiency and wire size optimization definitely improves. Now, the first thing you need to understand is, well, what is a skin depth? What, what's better? I mean, if you make a wire smaller, why does that making it better? Definition is skin depth. When you put energy in a wire, the self-inductance of the wire, which is an electrical property that resists current flow. So a wire with higher self-inductance resists current flow. And it just so happens that it tends to resist current flow from the inside of the wire out. So what happens as you go up in frequency is the frequencies want to basically ride on the outside of the wire more than the inside because, well, electricity is lazy. It's not going to go through the high impedance middle of the wire. It's going to go more towards the outside as frequency goes up. Now, if you go down, down, down in frequency to DC, 
the current goes through the entire cross section of the wire coherently. In other words, the energy through the wire is exactly the same all the way through the wire. The minute we put frequency in there, skin depth starts to change that. Well, now don't ask me why, but the definition of skin depth has been decided to be the point at which the energy on the surface of the wire decreases to only 37% of what it originally was at that original surface current measurement. And that's based on frequency. So every frequency you pick, what you would do to calculate skin depth is figure out where it's 37% as large in magnitude as it originally was on the surface of the wire. That's one skin depth, okay? And you can measure that at audio and it does exist in the wires we use. Now, the argument is, does that have anything to do with what the cable sounds like? Well, again, I attack this from a totally technical aspect of making it calculate better. So what I looked at is 1313A, which is one large 10 gauge wire, multi-strand cable wire. And I said, well, that doesn't really have very good current efficiency because this cable is pretty big. Most of the current at 20 kilohertz is more on the outside surface of the wire. There's quite a bit of differentiation in the current magnitude in that type of a large conductor. What do you do to improve that? Well, you have, you, you have to use multiple small conductors. If you use a conductor that's only one atom in size and line them all up, that's a hard wire to make, by the way. But if you could do it, the current has nowhere to go in a wire that's only one atom in diameter. That means any frequency I put on that wire it's going to be in the same place no matter what. So that would be a perfectly coherent alternating current transmission line. It's going to have really high resistance. It's not going to be practical, but in theory, if you can make a wire that small, it would be more coherent with respect to frequency. In other words, same current all the way through the cross section of the wire since we've limited it to just one atom in size. Okay, now at the bottom of this chart, everybody look at that skin depth number and you'll see that the skin depth at 20 kilohertz is supposed to be 20.1 mils. Don't take that for gospel. Engineers use what are called approximations when we come up with equations. And the more precise or exact you try to make an equation, the more difficult it becomes to use, even though it becomes more accurate. And they'll call these approximations and you'll have first approximation, second, third, so on and so forth. Uh, they really are attempts to make the fitted curves line up with Mother Nature throws at us when we actually measure the cable. And people will always get to the point to where say, okay, this equation is good enough, we're close enough. We don't, we don't really need to be any more accurate than this. So we see 21 point or 20.1 mils at 20 kilohertz is roughly an 18 gauge uh, skin depth. Now, if we go to other calculations, what you'll find is similar answers, but they're still gonna be different. Now here's two more skin depth calculations that you guys can Google and use on the internet, including the one from Stereo Review on the other slide. Now we'll see a value at 0.020, all right, megahertz or 20 kilohertz. We'll see a skin depth of 18.1 mils. Then if we go to the other equation, we'll see a skin depth down here showing about 18.5 mils. Okay, so we have differences, but they're fundamentally going to be pretty close. It just all depends on the number of approximations that you make about the wire. Okay, so just be aware that sometimes when we do these calculations, you're looking for the fundamental nature of what the information is telling you, not really the exact answer. So the fundamental nature of what this is telling me is, Galen, use a wire that's absolutely as small as possible to maximize current efficiency through the cross section of the wire. That's gonna have limits based on our machine handling capability, how many wires I can manage in that equipment, so on and so forth. But fundamentally, it definitely is telling me if I wanna optimize wire efficiency, I wanna use multiple small wires, not one big one. Now here's the characteristic that's interesting to where they show the velocity in meters per second. If you look at how an electromagnetic wave travels down a cable, Imagine a straw, it's full of marbles. If I push a marble in one end of that straw, a marble's gonna pop out the other end because there's no more room for say 10 marbles in a 10 marble long straw. So if I push in marble number of 11, the last marble at the end of the straw pops out and it does it instantaneously. The material that is made up in that straw 
whatever material that is has a resistance. When I try to push that marble into that straw, that tube's gonna offer resistance that determines how fast I can push that marble into the straw. That is the velocity of propagation, so to speak. In other words, it's telling me the velocity that I can put an electron into that straw. But our electromagnetic wave shows up at the end of the straw almost instantaneously. All right, that's our signal that pops out. But we put an electron in the opposite end of the cable and it didn't go anywhere. It just went into the end of the cable. So how can the signal be all the way at the other end? But believe it or not, that's how electromagnetic waves travel. They follow the phase shift of the electron, so to speak, as the valence bands push an electron from one valence band to the next as it goes down the wire. So the electron only went the width of one marble. Our marble is an electron, so to speak. But our signal pops out at the other end of the cable at the speed of the dielectric, because that determines how fast I can push that marble into the end of the straw. So what's called electron speed to a wire is actually really slow. If I push enough marbles into that straw, eventually that original marble I pushed in will pop out the end, all right? So that's what they talk about when they say, what's the electron flow in a cable? And it's actually pretty slow. It's in the meters per second range. However, the electromagnetic wave is traveling at the speed of the dielectric constant, which is really damn fast. Even if it's only 10% of the speed of light, that electromagnetic wave ends up at the end of the cable really, really quick. Okay, so that's kind of the fundamental nature of the signal that we're working with. And that's also one of the reasons that justify why people feel cable can't sound different because stuff happens so fast, it shouldn't make any difference. If you have something that's error in error, but it's only going a certain distance, that error basically gets less and less and less to where it theoretically shouldn't be able to be heard. So that's one of the arguments that you'll hear. And the data that can support that, if you look at just the numbers, I think are quite legitimate. Problem is, when you make the cable and listen to it, all of a sudden we have a problem. Our ears are detecting the difference. So what exactly is responsible for that change? Now, just looking at skin depth again, at DC, that top picture just shows the coherence of its signal all the way through a conductor. It's exactly the same. The skin depth, when you add alternating current to it, all of a sudden starts to alter that. So that's the current at the top of the conductor versus the middle of the conductor changes. And that basically screws up what I call current coherence. It's no longer consistent through the cross-section of the wire. We have a coherence problem. The conductors through the middle, or the actually just the uh, electron path through the middle of a wire is physically further apart or further from the surface of the wire, obviously, than the current right on the surface of the wire. We have a distance problem here now. Everything about time is distance. So the electron flow in the middle of the wire is creating a fundamentally different EM field than the wire at the surface of the conductor due to the fact that the signal strength and the amount of current generating that field is different. Those superimpose instantaneously one on top of the other to create our final EM magnetic field around the wire. That magnetic field is a summation of all the electrons moving through the cross section of a wire, not just one place or another, but all of them. And it happens so fast that it's virtually impossible to measure. But fundamentally, you're going to have a different sounding wire, in theory, if you have varying different magnetic field intensities creating that final EM wave than if you just have one. Problem is, with AC energy, we're forced to have more than one. So the only way to make it look like one is to use a smaller and smaller wire, which makes the current look more coherent or closer to the same through the frequency range that you're working within. All right, so the argument then can ensue, well, how much of that is really truly audible? It's an honest to God fact that it's occurring. How much can you hear? Well, again, my task was to make it better during this blue sky experiment, not necessarily to describe what just skin depth and current coherence improvements sounds like. There's too many things going on to actually single this out and say, this is it. You know, we got to do this. Uh, I chose to pretend I don't know what it is because I didn't. So everything to me was equally important across the board. When the project was finished, I did kind of have an opinion as to what we were actually hearing. Now, obviously, we have lots of different kinds of wire, right? All of these products that this guy's tangled up in have a different purpose and a different design criteria. 
audio cables are kind of strange uh, in that unlike a lot of cables, if they're made wrong, they don't work. Audio cables really can't be made, quote, wrong. I can always hook up something to one end of a wire and another and get it to, well, and get, you know, energy to go through it. And it'll make some sound at your speaker. They'll joke about, well, you can just take coat hanger wire, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But it's going to have a different sound quality and a different measured. Honestly, it's going to be different from a measurement standpoint. Where that line is drawn as to what you can hear and what you're actually hearing, we can debate. But I've done this for two years now, and wire definitely does sound different. Uh, and it did improve when I paid attention to the fundamentals with regard to the audio frequency range. So one at a time, I kind of went through these. And the first one we looked at again was skin depth. And the number one rule there, make the wire smaller is definitely better than making the wire bigger. The problem is I now have to use a lot of wires to make the cable work for another characteristic that's common to audio cables a lot of people aren't aware of. That determines the number of small wires I have to use based on the gauge of that wire that I pick. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Now, the other interesting thing about all audio cables that is a predominant reason they do sound different, we have capacitance effects, we have inductive effects. Capacitance and inductance and the like in a wire exist concurrently, all right? They exist at the same time. And we also have what are called electric fields and we have what are called magnetic fields. As we go lower and lower in frequency, the what we think of as the electromagnetic wave becomes more of a magnetic wave, okay? And it literally is like a magnet, so to speak. And, you know, that's a good example is a magnetic type wave. As we go up in frequency, the B field or the magnetic wave properties decrease, but the E field or the electric wave properties increase. But there's some of both all the time, no matter where you go. They just change the ratio from one to the other as you go up and down in frequency. The problem with audio is it's in a field or a frequency range to where those two fields actually are changing quite a bit between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. So we're in this transition zone where when you try to design a cable, you can't really design it just for capacitance. You can't design it just for inductance. You have to really pay attention to both, which means both attributes have to be kept relatively low, I think, if you're going to end up with a suitably decent sounding cable. So like it or not, an audio cable kind of has to be a jack of all trades. I really can't make a cable that has ultra low capacitance with really high inductance. I can't make a cable that has low inductance you know, with ultra high capacitance and vice versa, it doesn't work. I need to make them both low. And then we run into some other problems down the line that says, well, Galen, you got to decide which one's going to be higher though, because we got this other problem that we're going to get to towards the end of the slide is this kind of starts to get really interesting. Now, the other thing to note, your electric field always intersects your B field at a 90 degree angle, okay? And we're going to start to talk about things in a little bit with regards to phase and kind of what's going on there. And when you start to understand what phase and the like does due to inductance and capacitance, we're going to immediately start to see we can't make our beloved audio cables accurate moving data from A to B. We have a built-in problem that really can't be overcome. We can just make it better, but we can't overcome it. Now, at RF, we can sort of look at radio frequencies to get a little bit of an idea why, what might be going on in the audio frequencies with just certain attributes, but you gotta be careful because RF has a lot of constants that disappear. In other words, when you're, remember when you're in school and the professor in a math class would say, well, see this big, huge equation? Then you'd reduce it down to like four variables and you're thinking, oh, thank God. Well, somewhere in that conversation, he would say, well, since this number was really, really, really big and it was here, it can be zero or one. In other words, he can make them go away. What he's doing is he's using approximations to say, as you go up in frequency, for instance, we can throw out a bunch of these variables that actually have a big effect down low. So we only have a few left. So when you get to RF, the impedance of this cable is just the square root of L over C, for instance, and everything else disappears. Uh, what happens at RF is the cable becomes mostly resistive. 
And as it becomes mostly resistive, things become a lot easier to work with. Why? The cable becomes more coherent across the frequency range. In other words, it doesn't matter if I'm at one megahertz or 10 megahertz, certain attributes of that cable are virtually identical. The phase is identical, so on and so forth. And if a cable is mostly resistive, it doesn't have a lot of capacitance or inductive by definition. So it doesn't have a lot of phase shift and a lot of timing errors that a low frequency audio cable will have. In other words, RF cables are pretty darn good at moving stuff from A to B outside of what we call attenuation. So the signal gets smaller, but it's phase and group delay or timing errors of the various different frequencies in the cable are actually pretty darn good. We don't have that at our audio frequency ranges. We kind of got a bag of goods that kind of sucks really because it varies all over the place and we'll start to see some of that as we go through. Now, in this particular slide, I basically I took a constant 100 ohm cable and I looked at the velocity of propagation of the various different dielectrics and the dielectrics are over there on the right. And the velocity of propagation is basically just the square root of E or one, or excuse me, one over the square root of E is the velocity of propagation. So if I just take those numbers on the right hand side, if I take 1.3, I take one divided by square root of E, I'm gonna get roughly an 87% velocity. Now, when I know the impedance and I know the velocity, I can always calculate the capacitance in an RF cable. And I've done that and you can see the capacitance listed. But basically that's saying is you get higher capacitance with poorer and poorer dielectrics. Okay, now that's fundamentally true at RF. The problem is in the audio band, the dielectric properties of a cable aren't consistent with respect to frequency. So I can't look at a cable like I can at RF and say, oh, the velocity is 87%. Well, most people say for a coax cable, that means the velocity is the same from one megahertz all the way out to eight gigahertz or something like that. It's always the same. That's not true at audio. Now, one thing that is true is once I determine the capacitance at RF, believe it or not, that capacitance will remain constant all the way down through the audio range. As a matter of fact, if you take a cable, an RF cable, RG59, and I measure it in the lab, I measure it at one kilohertz, believe it or not, and the capacitance will remain constant with respect to frequency. So our capacitance at audio is dependent a lot on the properties of the dielectric, okay? But unfortunately at audio, the velocity of propagation, unlike RF, has a whole bunch of terms that aren't zero or one and change the properties of the VP at every single individual frequency has a different velocity of propagation. That's not a whole lot of fun and we'll find out why. This is a chart that shows just what was on the previous slide in a graph that just shows it as sort of a e to the minus x logarithmic curve. So as you change the picofarads per foot in the dielectric constant from one to a six, you can start to see the capacitance goes up dramatically. So what this basically says, if you want low capacitance, you want to use a really good quality dielectric. Now I'll explain why we want to do that in just a moment. Now, this chart looks scary. It's not. Basically, dielectrics are an electrical component. I know we think of a dielectric as an insulator, it is, but a dielectric, believe it or not, also has characteristics of a capacitor in it. And we call this, in colloquial terms, and you know, in RF engineering, they call it dissipation factor properties. Loss tangent is just a part of what comprises what's called the dissipation factor. All last loss tangent is describing is the amount of energy that's lost in a dielectric due to the fact that the dielectric is not a purely resistive vector, okay? The tangent of that vector describes how much energy is lost in the dielectric or absorbed by the dielectric as a reactive component. And reactive components store current or store voltage, but only temporarily. They don't hold on to it forever. They just tend to store it and then release it later, but it is a form of distortion. So a dielectric isn't a pure resistor, but this primarily only is occurring at RF frequencies. And when I say RF frequencies, I mean way up there. So if we look, now I use FEP in my designs, but if we look at the lost tangents, 
look at the frequencies, everybody. Three gigahertz and higher, three to 10 gigahertz on the Teflon. I know we like to think our beloved cables respond to the dielectric in ways that are unique, but they don't. Uh, the dielectric properties at audio will reverse polarities and respond to loss tangents, you know, quite readily. The data doesn't suggest there's a reason to use FDP other than it provides me with very good capacitance numbers due to the dielectric constant. When you have a good dielectric constant, what that means is I can put two wires closer together, okay, and still have low capacitance, but the closer I can put those two wires together, the lower my inductance is. So your capacitance between two wires is determined by the plastic, plastic between them. So capacitance, think, is the result of the dielectric and the closeness of that dielectric. Inductance doesn't see the plastic between the wires. It only knows how close those two magnetic fields are to one another. So if I want low capacitance and low inductance, I need a material that has a low dielectric constant so I can put the wires closer together so it doesn't raise capacitance, but I can still get a low inductance. But that's still not good enough, as I found out when I started working with these cables. There's something that has to be significantly different if I'm gonna really improve these cables. So only part of the problem was determining what the dielectric was. And the dielectric was not the answer, you know, the full answer to making these cables. So I can't say dielectric is gonna be a magic material. I don't care if it's silk uh, or what it is. It's only gonna be a building block to make a better cable, but it's not gonna be the better cable. It's just gonna be a component you can use more effectively. Now, if I look at a cable, all right, and this is one of my prototypes, and this is to prove my point I mentioned earlier, that capacitance stays very consistent across the uh, frequency range and from conductor to conductor. Now, in this particular cable I built, it had 24 wires in it in a very unique weave, but I wanted to make sure that capacitance on every single one of those wires is the same. In other words, I wanted it to be coherent. Now, the problem with a lot of cables with a multiplicity of wires is that they're geometrically not the same wire. They literally are different cables. So now we actually have multiple cables within a cable. And I didn't want to do that. I'm not that smart. I can't manage 24 different cables that all technically sound different because they're all going to electrically measure different. I need 24 wires to look like one wire. Well, one of the ways you have to figure out what to do with that is to make the R, L, and C identical between all 24 of those wires and solve some other problems. Here you can see 24 individual measurements. One is done at one kilohertz, the green. The other one I measured at 10 kilohertz. And if you notice, the values are almost identical at those frequencies. So they're going to be a very small change as you go up in frequency, but not significant. In other words, one's 14.5. The other one's a little under 15. So they're essentially the same capacitance with respect to frequency. Certainly through the audio band, they're very close. So this is just, like I said, one of the earlier designs where I took all 24 wires in one polarity and I grounded them, okay? So if this was my cable, all is easy to be grounded. And then all 24 wires in this particular polarity from one wire at a time to this with all wires grounded would be measured. And that's what that measurement actually is. And what that shows is, are, is every wire in that cable theoretically the same wire? Doesn't matter what wire I pick, it's gonna be electrically identical. And that was one of the tests that we had to do. Now, this is kind of how we did that, is we actually have two polarities, okay? And we have these two polarities, and I basically stack one on top of the other, but I want to make sure every wire in this polarity relative to this wire are geometrically the same distance from one another all along the length of the cable. And that will ensure a consistent capacitance. And what did that, this is very unique weave that I came up with, with using what's called bonded pair, all right, technology from the Ethernet business, actually. And uh, that allowed me to match and keep inductance low because the wires are very close together. That matches inductance plus something else that's kind of the magic sauce we're going to talk about. But the other thing it did is it made sure every single wire in this weave pattern, all the wires eventually are near each other on the inside surface of this construction, and every wire is on the outside surface, and every wire ends up being on the outer edges as you go down the length of the wire because it's a helical weave pattern. 
And that's how every single wire looks the same capacitively because I distribute the capacitance. Sometimes wires are far apart. Sometimes wires are close together, but the distribution of those two physical geometric differences lower the average capacitance. So again, wires all about the geometry. There's no magical spray, you know, sayings or material or anything that's going to take that away. The wire is all about the geometry in terms of how it's built. Now, to prove that, I can take a flat cable and Belden makes flat cable. And this is a picture of what we had. And I use this for experimental purposes. And I made the pick, I made the cable that's in that upper right corner. And I did the same thing before I soldered the ends all together. I measured the capacitance from one wire to all other wires grounded. In other words, I measure a wire from all 64 to ground. And what you see when you look at 1K and 10K, again, the capacitance is the same, which is good. So we know the capacitance is very consistent with respect to frequency, but notice what's happening though in this cable. The physical nature of how this cable's built says every single 64, one of those wires is theoretically a different wire because it has a different capacitance. When it has a different capacitance, it has a different inductance, has a different impedance. You're theoretically listening to 64 cables at the same time. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but that's kind of creepy. And I don't think that's gonna work so good. Uh, and if you look at the data, you can see that it goes from a little bit over 30 picofarads per foot to as high as 70 by the time you get to the two outermost wires. In other words, the wire that's physically farthest from the ground plane reference, the other polarity, has the uh, lowest cap. And then of course, the opposite side, when you take the wire that's closest, those two, you're gonna have the lowest cap. So flat cable has this geometry problem, all right? You have wires that are real close together with high cap. You have wires that are really far apart in K with low cap. None of them are the same because they got everything in between. So I chose basically to not use this kind of a construction, all right, because of the problems it entails. Yet it had a lot of wires in it, which is my primary requirement by minimizing skin depth using multiple small wires. But I wasn't really satisfied that the cable was, quote, coherent when it came to capacitance. I didn't see consistency uh, in this type of design. So as much as it looks good for certain aspects, on average, I didn't want on average. I wanted good across the board on every single wire. And I was looking for coherence more than anything else, because I think it's important that we listen to one cable when we hook it up to our speakers, not multiple different wires in a cable, all vying to be slightly different. And they will based on their physical properties and what that does to the other characteristics. Now, another thing that we look at is phase. I know everybody likes to say, well, cable's a first order filter and it rolls off my highs. It does, but it does it at a very, very high frequency. Any first order filter at what's called the F sub C filter will alter the phase shift 45 degrees at the 3 dB down point. We don't want that, but let's be realistic. Let's take a 10 foot piece of cable and let's put the values in an equation that you can go out on the internet and pull up these little guys, plug them in. I can put my resistance in there, roughly 0.02. I can put my capacitance in there, 450 picofarads for a 10 foot piece, all right? And I can calculate the uh, what's called the F sub C frequency. In other words, where is it minus 3 dB? Look at that. You know, we got, <laughs> you know, look, look at the number. It's in the megahertz. It's way, 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 way of the audio band. Now that phase shift is there and it superimposes itself on top of everything that's going on in the audio frequency. So everything just kind of stacks up and adds, so to speak. So that's what's called superposition is all these environments add up. The problem is this is adding up way out at the RF region where we can't hear it. So in a lot of ways, capacitance in a cable per se isn't really a problem in terms of the minus 3 dB frequency and the roll off first order filter properties. I'll get to why you don't want high capacitance in a cable, but it isn't because it's rolling off our highs. It has nothing at all to do with that. It has something to do with another component in the chain where the cable's put that can really mess stuff up. But as far as viewing cable from a First order filter roll off, my initial calculations told Galen, uh, 
there's no reason to try to make the capacitance ultra, ultra low to make the bandwidth of that first order filter really, really, really wide. It's already sufficiently wide relative to audio, even with kind of high capacitance, to be honest with you. But that high capacitance is screwing some other stuff up uh, that we, but we might not want to deal with. So I kept capacitance low, not because it, quote, doesn't roll off the highs. I know people think that they know more about how my cable works than I do, but I did not make the capacitance low because I was afraid of the first order filter effect because the numbers basically indicate that that's well above the audio frequency range. So there's other problems that make these cables sound different. This isn't really it. Now you have phase shift also in a filter, right? Well, if I take that previous design and I take the F sub C frequency that it says it uh, exhibits based on its uh, you know, measured values, R and C and what have you, I can measure the phase shift in any frequency. Well, if I put in 20 kilohertz, the highest audio frequency we can typically hear, most of you guys, I'm 63, I can hear the 13.5K, so you got it on me. But look what the phase shift is at that frequency, okay? It's minus 1.135 degrees, you know, or e to the minus fifth degrees. It's almost nothing. So down at 20 kilohertz, there is, there's essentially no phase shift. Now here, I'm making an engineering approximation. I'm saying negative 1.135 times 10 to the minus fifth degrees is nothing. It's not nothing. It's 1.135. Some people will argue, you know, to that level of nuance. I won't. So as far as I'm concerned, phase shift from first order filter effects in my cable or any reasonably well-designed audio cable isn't an issue. I'll, I'll stand my ground to say that, that I don't think we're hearing that. Now, our ears are very sensitive to time shift in signals, but I don't think this particular aspect of audio cable design is what is causing an intense problem uh, that it needs to be specifically addressed. And a reasonably well-made cable will automatically address it. It's not that it's not being addressed at all, but I think it's being adequately addressed with standard cable design. Now, if we look at capacitors and inductors, we need to understand what these critters are doing and what they're doing in the audio frequency range. In the audio frequency range, remember, our capacitive characteristics and our inductive properties are generally frequency related because they have what's called capacitive and inductive reactants, which have frequency in the equations, okay? C equals one divided by two pi F X sub C. Well, you got F in there, that's frequency. Inductance is X sub L equals two pi F L. Well, we still have frequency in there. So we automatically have these components acting differently at different frequencies. When you go sufficiently high in frequency though, if you put F in there and you put infinity in there for F, does two pi matter anymore? No, it doesn't, you know? So when these numbers start to get really big, some values can look like infinity. They, you can call that basically zero. And some values look like they're just a one. If they get small enough, you can basically say they disappear. So you replace it with a one in the equation or nothing. Uh, but in the audio range, we can't do that. Now, capacitors are strange beasts in that people tend to look at these things at the audio. And we have all kinds of capacitors. And the reason we have all kinds of capacitors in the audio frequency range is capacitors don't really work very well at low frequencies. And like it or not, audio goes pretty low. They go down to 20 hertz. That's pretty low. They start to get reasonably high, I guess, 20 kilohertz. But nonetheless, for a capacitor, 20 kilohertz still isn't really very high. Capacitors don't like to pass alternating current the lower in frequency you go. That's why what's called the capacitive reactance goes up with frequency, as you can see in that graph. It's basically saying, hey, if you've got a capacitor, going low in frequency isn't the best place to go if you want this capacitor to pass a signal. Now, inductance, that's opposite capacitance. So basically, the inductive reactance is basically saying, okay, the opposite of capacitive reactance. So a capacitor resists changes in voltage inductance resist changes in all right, current. So if I put a signal across an inductor, you're gonna instantaneously see a voltage, but you're not gonna see much current because it's basically saying, no, I don't wanna pass current down at zero hertz, so to speak. I wanna pass voltage. So as time goes on, my current goes up, but my voltage disappears. 
capacitance or capacitors are just the opposite. If I put a signal across a capacitor, I will basically see no voltage at all instantaneously, but I'll see a massive amount of current. And then as I wait a little while and the capacitance, the capacitor charges up, I'll see the voltage reach my signal voltage I applied to it, whatever that is, one volt, two volt, 10 volts. But eventually now the current disappears, just the opposite. So these two devices act equal and opposite. They both shift phase opposite each other as well, which is another time-based problem that we see in this particular chart. Now, all of this stuff, by the way, is true in theory, if you have a pure reactive circuit, what that means is a circuit is all capacitive or it's all inductive. Don't believe that. Every capacitor has the other two variables in it because we have R, L, and C. So if I pick C, I know it has L and R in there. Sometimes people look at a capacitor specs and you'll see things, all right, you know, equivalent series, resistance, all these various different aspects of a capacitor. What that's doing is telling you how much a capacitor isn't really a capacitor. Inductors are the same. Inductance isn't supposed to have any resistance in it at all. It does because it's got wires. It's not supposed to have any capacitance in it at all, but those wires are insulated with varnish and they're close together. That makes a capacitor. So there's always going to be a little bit of a capacitor and an inductor, so on and so forth. So there's nothing but a that's really truly a pure reactive circuit. So just bear that in mind that this is kind of a theoretical, what you see is close to what you're going to get. Now, this particular slide, that black sine wave that you're looking at, that's our starting point. That would be if everything was in phase, our race cars are lined up at the start finish line and everybody's bumper is right across from each other. Nobody's ahead or behind. Well, if we look at the red trace that's current, we're gonna see that that's actually shifted in time, all right? The voltage is ahead of the current by 90 degrees in phase, all right? So, we're kind of going, hmm, that ain't so good, is it? Because that's a time-based error. That automatically is saying that our circuit is, is skewing when we hear information. A capacitor or an inductor can't do work in a circuit. They store voltage capacitor or they store current and inductor. They shift as time-based. We can only do work when that goes to a resistive reference, all right? So if I have a if I put a pure capacitor and try to get it to do work, it won't do anything because the capacitor says, no, 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 I don't do work. I just hang on to work. And a doctor is going to say, no, 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 I won't let you have my current. You know, I'm just going to resist the current. You know, it's not going to give it to you when you want it. It's going to store it. It will release it, but 90 degrees out of phase with the other attribute. So we have this yin-yang thing going on with capacitance and inductance. So uh, cables are exactly that. We're basically putting our LC networks between our amp and our speaker that are definitely storing and releasing energy at different times. So we need to basically make sure that we try to mitigate that by keeping, well, L and C as low as we possibly can because they have a time-based distortion property uh, that the higher in value they are, the more difficult it is to make them have a minimize or minimize their effect on our voltage signals. So that's one of the reasons you definitely want to keep L and C both low because our circuits carry voltage and current. But we have different approximations we have to make when we're making a speaker cable than an interconnect. And we'll hit on what some of those are as well. It'll all start to make a little more sense as we get into this a little more deeply. Now, here's an interesting chart. Now, this is a good website, you guys. This is a company called QED. They're in England. Uh, you should go to this website, by the way, and go to their tech section and read some of their stuff. It's quite interesting. They try to do things on more of a scientific empirical bent as well as calculated nature, similar to what I'm doing. Again, you know, there's a lot of good people out there making cables, not just me. But what they did is they looked at two cables or, you know, set of cables and uh, 13 samples and said, well, what does phase do relative to inductance. And they basically say, well, a long story short, lower inductance yields lower phase shift. And if we look at this graph, and let's look at that and say, okay, that's probably gonna average out to be about four degrees of phase shift at 20 kilohertz, because down there it says that this was all done at 20 kilohertz. The phase is gonna vary based on frequency, by the way. 
because this is the audio frequency range and like it or not, every single frequency in the audio range is gonna have a unique set of parameters that you actually measure, like it or not. So you have to know the frequency when you work with audio cables, RF not so much. I can look at RF and say the phase shift in a uh, RF cable is basically almost nothing because it's almost really purely resistive. That's not the case with an audio cable. So you always need to know the frequency with an audio cable or you really don't know anything because the numbers change dramatically between 20 Hertz and 20,000 kilohertz. So let's just, just remember this slide. And the important thing to do is let's just remember for now that that phase shift it's saying is around four degrees, maybe five, worst case, let's say there's some that are right around five, 20 kilohertz. So let's just kind of stick that in your craw. And we're gonna look at some other measurements to see if I think that that's really happening fundamentally in cable. Now, when I developed this product, one of the things I mentioned earlier is I use technology from bonded pair RF cables. Well, why would I use technology from an RF cable? Everybody said my cable's nothing but category six cable sold at a high price. Well, no, it's not. I use a bonded pair that is used in ethernet cable, but the dimensions of the wire and the dimensions and the insulation around the wire are completely different than what you would use to make a good quality ethernet cable. As a matter of fact, my cable would fail the ethernet test hands down. It's not made to be an RF cable. It's designed to be a low frequency, low capacitance, low inductance audio cable. Now, if you took that bonded pair, which is little by the way, you know, we're talking the cable, you know, this is the bonded pair right here. I don't know if you guys can see what I'm showing. Uh, yeah. And it's just, a, yeah, so it's it's little. So you couldn't really use that as a speaker cable, even if you wanted to. And there's a reason why you couldn't use that as a speaker cable, because it actually isn't very good. And so how do I make something that's not very good, really good by putting into this type of a design? And that's something that we're gonna to get to that's kind of really cool how this works out. That particular cable, if I measure the inductance, in other words, it's resistance to current flow is around 0.126 microhenries per foot. That's not terrible but it's not world-class either, all right? Uh, so people said, well, God, Galen, you start with something that's pretty dang on high and you try to get the inductance as low as you can. I use FEP, so the dielectric constant is low. So the capacitance between those two conductors is about 12.5 picofarads per foot. Remember, I wanna keep both low. I'm not making a cable that has low cap or low inductance. I want them both to be low and that's a lot harder to do. I can put two flat sheets of copper together with a half mil mylar film between them and I can make a low inductance cable, but my capacitance goes to like 3000 picofarads per foot. I'm not making a cable that basically is an electrical component hooked to the back of your speaker. That's not really in my mind's eye, a transmission line, that's a capacitor. There's cables that are just opposite of that, They're designed to be really low cap, but they let the inductance go really high. So, you know, do you wanna buy a inductor or a capacitor and use it as a cable? I don't. I don't think so. I think you really want to see a cable to be zero R, L, and C. So I think my task was to meet that requirement, at least when I set out to design these. So if I take a bonded pair, I could do something kind of neat with that. And one thing I can do, yes, I did take it from the patented technology Belden has that enables us to make really high quality bonded zip cord really if you want to call this zip cord you can so i'm, I'm kind of saying zip cord yeah that's that's pretty good but you got to do something else with it to make it truly truly good and that is we need to move it electromagnetically from what it thinks it is in a zip cord to a different type of design now what we do is we take these bonded pairs and you can count those spools where we got two four six eight ten twelve pairs 24 conductors all right, and we take those zip cords and we weave them into a flat weave that's one of our speaker polarities. We actually have two, remember? We got this guy and this guy. This is just, you're looking at one. Now, why is that one red and this one blue? It's because that just demonstrates that we have different copper inside these things. We don't want the plant to get them mixed up. So the TPC is red. The OFE with the silver plate actually comes out to be kind of a pretty light bluish color. And the OFE, which has a different type of texture to it with the orange conductor ends up being sort of a violet color. So that way we don't wind up these getting these expensive coppers mixed up. 
Now, here's the cool thing. Because we have bonded pairs, and I've got little circles drawn around these various bonded pairs that kind of float around in the cable, you can see the, the one in the uh, bottom left. It's a perfect star quad, isn't it? Well, when you arrange two wires as a perfect star quad, they have additional field cancellation properties. So the fields cancel between two wires. They cancel even more when you put four wires in a star quad. And I got some pictures that'll show what's going on there. What does that do though? That took a cable that had a 0.126 microhenries of inductance and chunks it down to 0 0.08, a massive, massive improvement. So if people don't think electromagnetic field cancellation works, I beg to differ. The, me the measurements show that it works beyond the shadow of a doubt in this particular design. It works massively well. We reduced the inductance by what, 63% or somewhere in there. Uh, so this is how we take a pretty good zip cord and make it absolutely fantastic. And we also do it with a minimal rise in capacitance. Now, anytime you hear someone say, you have a particular fundamental cable, like my zip cord was 12 puff, 0.126. Now I've dropped the inductance to 0 0.08, but the capacitance went from 12 to about 45 nominal. Why does this happen? Because it's a yin yang thing. When you lower capacitance, you automatically raise inductance. You cannot, all right, lower both unless you fundamentally start with a lower component going in. So if my bonded pair coming in, I change the insulation wall on that, to be thinner or thicker, the amount that the inductance drops and the amount the capacitance rises is going to be different. But it's still fundamentally attached to its mother in terms of you know one value being higher or lower. So if you try to shift those, the other one's going to go up. So it's like pushing a peg down, the other peg goes up. Push this peg down, the opposite one goes up again. So you have to balance it. Now you're going to ask me, well, why did you let the capacitance go to 45 and you chose to let the inductance be 0 0.08? I have an answer for that. None of this stuff in this cable was an accident. I went to the 45 after multiple, multiple design trials and measurements, and I knew where I was going. I knew why I had to get there. But to the unaided eye, you kind of think, eh, I don't think 45 is that. It should be 17, and I would have made the inductance go somewhere else. Well, I think at the end of the presentation, I'll convince you why you don't want to do that. And it's all based on the science. Now, here's two of the XLR cables. This one, if you notice, I only have one conductor in it. That's what's called the series one. And it's in a star quad. You'd have four conductors arranged in a square and those have additional magnetic field cancellation. And in a, uh, that particular design, since it's an interconnect cable, you really wanna keep the capacitance low because you're moving voltage. You don't have much current in an interconnect cable. So the transfer function for voltage is important in interconnect but you still want low inductance because low inductance is associated with good phase properties as well through the audio band. Why is that? Capacitance adjusts your phase in the high frequency range way out where we can hear it. Inductance does the opposite. It actually affects phase in the very low frequency range where it can be heard, all right? And we have a slide that'll also show that effect going on here in a little bit. Now the series two, if you look at that, engineering drawing, what you'll see is four wires inside a little star. That is my additional star quad configuration designed to lower inductance, okay, to further drop inductance. And it drops it from about 0.15 in the series one, and it drops it down to 0.11 nominal in the series two. But I don't get that for free. The capacitance increases slightly to 17.5 picofarads per foot. But I also did that on purpose because, again, when we get kind of towards the end of the slide where all this kind of stuff, the problem with presentations on cable is I like to tell you everything at once, but I can't. I got to tell you one thing at a time and then loop back around to the beginning and sort of tie it all together for you. So trust me on this. There's a reason why I let the capacitance go up a little bit to 17.5 and why I wanted to use four even smaller wires. Those are four 30 gauge wires in there versus the 125 gauge wire. So there's some trade-offs that I did to get the sound quality that I was after based on how this stuff honestly really works. So I didn't listen to things in isolation. I had to look at everything individually, improve each attribute, make the whole cable 
and listen to it and eventually see what happens. But in the process of making each of these cables, I came to the realization that the previous design efforts were missing something. So I would go back in, make some changes, realize I was missing something, go back in, make some more adjustments. And that's kind of how this all happens. Now, here's a wonderful artist illustration by yours truly that shows what happens with just two wires that have current going through them in the same direction. So in the middle of that drawing, you'll see two little circles with a plus and a plus. That basically means the current's going the same direction. Now, if you notice, one wire has a wire going clockwise, okay, around it, and the other one has the wire going counterclockwise, and that basically cancels when the two field energies hit in the middle between those two conductors. That's called magnetic field cancellation. It takes energy to increase a magnetic field and decrease a magnetic field every time you alternate the signal, plus minus, alternating current, AC, that's what music is. The lower those fields can be, the less energy it takes to flip the current going one direction to the other, okay? So in theory, a perfect inductive cable would have those two wires infinitely close together or really one on top of the other. So the magnetic fields would be concentric, but in opposite directions, they would completely cancel. You'd have no inductance, so to speak. But you can't do that because a wire can't go two different ways in the same wire that's superimposed one on top of the other, so to speak. It can't do it. So the best you can do is put the two wires directly together or as close as you can get them together. But you can't do that because the capacitance goes way high. So you have to decide how close those two wires are to one another and how much field cancellation you're going to get, at least at this stage of the game. Then you do the additional field cancellation in the design of that particular component or that bonded pair. So you can't get it done at this stage. You can just get it partly done. Uh, then you require the additional complexity to design to finish the story and get it from 0.126 down to 0.08. Uh, and that was what that weave pattern does. Alan, on your image that you have there, when you drew that yourself, yeah, both the bonded pair are both running the same current, positive or negative? They're, well, one polarity is, of course, going to be negative when the other one's positive and vice versa, since it's alternating current. But each bonded pair within a polarity, this, right? Mm -hmm. So we got two. All the, all the current and all of the bonded pairs here, go, the current's going this way, and all the bonded pairs in here, the current's going that way. Okay. Okay. And these basically, you get field cancellation between the two wires, because if you use the right hand rule, if the current's going this way, I grab it like this and all my currents are going that way, but my field's looping around this way. If you do that for two wires, all right, like so, you, what you find out is the currents are equal and opposite. So they loop around and cancel in the middle. All mm -hmm. right, when those two fields come together, they're actually bucking against each other and they, they, they don't totally cancel. They mostly cancel or else we'd have zero inductance cables. We don't. Uh, so what you do is you try to, I try to basically make this subcomponent as good as I could get it. And then I had to invent this to make it get to 0 0.08. And I had to do that for a lot of really important reasons that are really kind of cool as I kind of figured this all out as I went. But like I said, it took me two years of thinking and struggling to figure out what am I doing and why am I doing it? And I got to stick with the science, guys. I can't. You know, I'm at Belden, I'm an engineer. I can't go with the coulda, woulda, shouldas. You know, maybe it works like this stuff. I actually had to measure this stuff and actually prove that it really is working in my management. Now in a star quad, like what we have in the speaker cable, okay? Or, you know, if we go back to here, remember, we had these star quads that you see. So we got the star quads in there and all of those are reducing inductance, by the way. And that's how it gets down to the 0 0.08. We have our star quad again in the series two, but we actually have dual star quad in the series two. We got the four little 30 gauges in each wire, and then we have four wires as well, which also cancel and lower inductance, all right? Now, the danger to this design is it can raise capacitance quite markedly. Uh, and that's where I had to come up with unique design that had relatively low capacitance as well. So to get low capacitance, I had to space these guys apart, but that's bad for inductance. You want the wires close together for low inductance. So I had to come up with a design that magnetically reduced inductance 
in the subcomponent itself, if I was going to lower the overall inductance of the cable and keep the capacitance from going too high. So that's why the Series 2 only went up to 17 and a half puff. The Series 1's 12 and a half picofarads, but it has higher inductance because a single wire doesn't have any inductive cancellation properties built in. So it's not magic. I can, you know, I can explain why each one does what it does and they follow the physics of, you know, what I expect it to do. So to me, better is better on the Series 2 because it does have self-inductance properties built in. And I needed that capacitance and inductance for other reasons, which I'll explain a little later. Okay, so again, here's our fields. And this is what happens in a star quad. If you follow these arrows around, you'll see that every single arrow cancels when it gets to the middle, okay? So all fields go to Rome, so to speak, in this cable, and they all collide with one another. Uh, so that 0.196 microhenries per foot that's too high in a single bonded pair, I need to figure out a way to cancel those fields within the speaker cable somehow, all the while not raising capacitance. And what I used is I basically built the speaker cable using star quad type technology that normally has been used in the past in XLR cables. And then in the XLR cable, I further modified it to use dual star quads to further reduce the inductance of these products and use much, much smaller wire for better and better skin depth current coherence. And something else that's going to be really cool that I don't think most audiophiles are aware of that cables do that's quite measurable. Now, the first design I did, I actually made these by hand, uh, and that's the orange cable down there in the picture. I about got permanent arthritis on my thumbs from weaving those suckers. It took me two days of weaving to make a seven foot length of that cable. And that's one of the very early prototypes I used to just basically test my theory. If I do A, does it go towards B? I didn't expect to get to B, but I wanted to know it was going in the right direction. Then as I became more sophisticated, you can see the cable on the top there looks more like a quote, real speaker cable. And I started making the prototypes. That design, by the way, still failed my requirements. And of course, I had different iterations of weave trying to figure out, okay, I need to optimize the number of conductors I use and I need to op optimize the picks. The picks basically are a description of the number of little spaces in the wires. See the little triangular spaces in these these bonded pairs, if you hold it up to the light, there's actually, you can see little holes. If I count the holes in the wire, that's called a pick. And you determine how many number of those are per inch and there's more wire, that means capacitance is higher. If I make fewer picks, the capacitance goes lower, but guess what? The inductance goes the opposite way. So you have to figure out a way to balance your inductive and capacitance. Well, when I'm trying to make each one of those attributes more coherent, or more consistent, you got to know what, why, where do you want it to balance? I'm on this teeter totter, right? And physics says I can't make it perfectly level, but I have to decide which end's higher or lower. I have to know why, when I make these cables, what I'm doing and why you're doing it. And that's the hard part. I mean, you know, in some ways, knowing where you're going is easy, all right? Knowing why you're going there sometimes can be the harder thing to do. So this is just an example of the braids that come off that machine. So we have the TPC on the red there, and then we have the OFE on the right. And I'll explain, by the way, why we use the coppers that we do. That seems mysterious, but it isn't. Now to hold those two clarities together, I use a nylon weave to really braid those guys as tight and compact as possible. Reason being is you want to keep your inductance really low. You work like the Dickens to develop a component that can give you low inductance. If you let those two inductance go apart, it creates what's called a loop area. And remember the equations for inductance, if you look at them, only are determined by how closely two wires can physically be to one another. So if you want low inductance, you definitely don't want to let those two polarities move apart from one another. You want to bind them down tightly together. That's bad for capacitance, right? So what you do with capacitance is you have to look at the dielectric that's between those wires because the capacitance is associated with the dielectric and distance both. So get a dielectric in there that's a low dielectric constant and design the cable such as I've done, such that each wire 
if and always as close to one another as possible. Sometimes the two wires are on the top, sometimes they're on the side, sometimes they're in the middle. So that's what's called distributing the capacitance so that the group or bulk capacitance of the cable is quite a bit lower. The product line is called Iconoclast because the gentleman in the lab that initially measured this final prototype came and told me, Galen, we can't, we can't measure your cable today. I said, well, why not? He said, the, the machine's busted. And Carl Dole's like, well, just get out the reference test sample. And he said, well, I don't know where that is. And he says, okay. So Carl, the head test lab, one of the head test lab guys went back there with me and David Miller. And we looked at the equipment and he measured the, the calibration standard. And lo and behold, it came out 17 and a half picofarads dead nuts. And he said, no, the machine's fine. Why? And David said, well, that can't be right. This cable's only measuring 45 picofarads per foot. And I know that a 25 pair tight cable like this should be over 300 and it's not, something's not right. And I said, well, what's not right is the way you make a cable for digital versus the way I design it for analog. And he said, you're kidding me. He said, your design changed that from 300 all the way down to 45. He said, that's impossible. He said, that's iconoclastic. And uh, I said, you know, you just named our product line, David. So that's how the product line came to be called Iconoclast because it went against his quote, long held beliefs as to what the capacitance should have been when we designed the cable versus what he actually measured. And he drew me to task to try to prove that measurement was wrong. And he finally convinced himself it was right. And uh, basically this is how we did it, is if you look at that weave, you'll have two conductors that can be on the outer surface of that weave. And sometimes they're on the inner surface and sometimes they're transitioning between the top and the bottom. You have minimum capacitance between two wires when they're at the farthest from each other, top and bottom. You have the highest capacitance when two conductors are the closest together inside, all right? And the average of those comes out to right, roughly 45 picofarads per foot bulk. The inductance is more determined by the uh, star quad cancellation because it's a magnetic field proximity effect. To reduce inductance, you want things to be really close together. So the bulk of the inductive reactance reduction is caused by how close those little miniature star quads are to one another. Secondary is how close those two polarities are to one another, but that's a secondary variable because it's a logarithmic effect on reducing inductance. It's all distance and magnetic field relationships. The magnetic fields decrease with the square of the distance, or another way to look at it is they get more and more important the closer they are together. So if you're an inch apart versus two inches apart, that's four times more critical than it is at two inches because the field is four times stronger and so on and so forth. So you want the two polarities to be really close together as best you can. But the primary working force in this cable though is the way I designed in the star quads with using those bonded pairs that create star quads or partial star quads as it goes down the length of the cable. They still reduce the magnetic fields between the four wires, but not as well as when they're perfectly lined up as a perfect square, so to speak. In other words, a perfect star quad. And they'll go in and out of that configuration as they go down the cable. But the point is they're reducing the inductance always to some extent, which is how I got the inductance from again, 0.126 down to 0 0.08. So again, it's just science and understanding what's happening and also understanding I have to do something with capacitance. I don't wanna be damaging uh, the reputation and the performance of this cable by just letting the capacitance go to 3000 or more picofarads per foot. So that's kind of the first picture of the final form the cable winded up taking right there. So we have the two woven polarities held together by the nylon binding. And uh, that's our one of our first pictures of the iconoclast cable in its final form. Now, when we took that final form, like I said earlier, is the capacitance consistent? In other words, is every wire in that cable measured to the other 24 wires grounded the same? So I got 24 measurements in this slide and they're measured to the other 24 wires grounded. In other words, that's the ground reference. So is every single wire measured to that reference point look like the same wire? In other words, is it gonna have the same inductance, same capacitance? Now I already know inductance is directly tied to capacitance. So if my capacitance is always the same, I know my inductance is always the same. So I basically measured it and you can see the average picofarads, all right, in there is 175 measured in this particular fashion. And I noticed the standard deviation between them is 2.4. That's kind of the 
variation within the cable. Nothing's going to be exactly, exactly the same. There's some are going to be a little higher, some are going to be a little lower. Like you have 171 and I see a 177. So they're predominantly going to be the same. But the, the minimum was 171, the max was 180, the average is 175. So for a cable with 24 wires in it, each wire is acting fundamentally, for the first proclamation, identical, which is what I wanted. I wanted a design to where any wire in that cable is basically the same wire. So I only have one problem to solve, even though there's 24 wires. I didn't want 24 problems with 24 different wires. Not that smart. So I figured I'm just going to stick with one set of problems. Now, before I could decide how big a wire to use, I had to decide what is happening when we're moving a signal from A to B. What a cable does, of course, is move all the voltage from your amp to your speaker. Well, no, it doesn't. Some of that signal is lost on our cable because the speaker cable is a component and it has resistance. And if I run wire from A to B and it has a resistance and I'm in current through it, it'll drop a voltage across it. And that's just called the voltage divider formula. If my cable had no resistance at all, zero, we would know all the voltage is at our speaker. That's what we want. What happens if we make a speaker cable with infinite resistance? Well, then all the voltage will be on the cable. None will go on the speaker. So what you need to do is look at the impedance of the speaker because it's gonna be a ratio of the impedance or the resistance of the wire relative to the resistance of your speaker. And since the speaker can be as low as two ohms, if I don't want a lot of voltage to be dropped across the speaker cable, I need to make the speaker cable itself really, really, really low in resistance so that it doesn't appear to be much of a load relative to the speaker. So the voltage is always going to drop across the highest resistive component in the circuit. And it's going to be, and it's going to drop as a direct ratio between the two. So if I have a speaker cable, just for an easy example, that's one and a speaker that's two, the speakers are gonna have twice the voltage dropped across it as the cable, because it's a one, the speaker's a two, and you can make a two or a four, you know, an eight or a 16, so on and so forth. But we don't wanna see hardly any voltage dropped across the speaker cable. That's why this cable is roughly a 10 gauge aggregate size, because the resistance of the wire is so low that most of the signal is dropped across our speaker, but that makes me use what? bigger wire, right? I have to look at how many wires I can use in a machine and work with them. And I have to use an adequate number of wires to make sure that the resistance of the cable is low enough where it appears to be invisible between our amp and our speaker. Uh, so that's where the size of the wire comes in, okay? And that's why the wire ended up being the 0 0.020 diameter that it is. I knew I could use 24 of them. I used the wire as small as I could, and I made sure that the uh, resistance across the cable is much, much lower than the speaker. So if you look all the way down there at the bottom, it's almost cut off for some reason. I don't know why it did that, but I get 0.03 ohms basically on the cable. Our speaker is about two ohms minimum. So you can see that the cable is many, many, many orders of magnitude lower in resistance than our speaker. So that just ensures that the cable is doing what it's supposed to. At least I get the signal from A to B. The signal's not the same at A as it is B. The cable's distorting it, but they gone, it let's at least make sure we get it there. What, what good is it gonna do us to try to make the cable as good as we possibly can and then waste it all by dropping a lot of the energy across the cable and not the speaker. Now, we mentioned skin depth earlier. And I said that of course, as you go up in frequency, the signal goes to the outside surface of the wire. That is true, but guess what? There's something called proximity effect in that when we put current through a cable, like our speaker cable, we can put up to what, 23 amps or more can be going through a speaker cable quite high. The reason that is, of course, is our speakers are very low impedance. So if we're dropping 100 watts as amps times volts across a two ohm load, you don't have much R to do it. So you need a lot of current, okay? So the current in a speaker cable is pretty high. Well, when you run current through a cable, believe it or not, with two closely spaced wires, which of course I already told you that we wanna keep our polarities really close together and we run a lot of current through these guys, what happens is that pulls the current to the outside of the conductor if the wires are going in opposite directions or it pulls the current towards the middle if the wire's going 
Okay, the opposite. So we have two effects. The wire is either seeing the current push to the outside or it's being pulled to the inside. That also affects conductor efficiency. And it also does it based on frequency because as we're gonna see in another couple slides, the power going through an audio cable is dramatically different across the frequency range. So this stuff is go going on concurrent to skin effect. And it in, effect, in effect, this is combining with skin effect to make our wire efficiency look less than it really is with respect to frequency. People are gonna say, ah, you can't see that, that's not real. Uh, actually it is, and I got the measurements here to show you that you do see this effect uh, occurring in cables. And it happens more or less depending on the design of the cable, but it is really there. Now, how much and which of these you hear, again, debatable. Can you make a cable better by trying to maximize the conductor efficiency? Yes. If I had a conductor that was only, again, one atom in size, I wouldn't have proximity effect because the path that the electrons can take inside the wire are only, well, only got one way to go, right? So there's no skin effect, there's no proximity effect. As you make your wire bigger and bigger and bigger, you get more skin effect and you get more proximity effect because the paths that those electron can follow becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So it is real, it is there, and you wanna manage it and make it as good as you can. But again, there's still something else that kind of falls on top of this thing that kind of makes you realize how mother nature kind of says, hey, you know, if you think I'm not important, you're gonna get in trouble because I like to connect everything together in a nice seamless whole. It's like Einstein, you know what? He said the universe wasn't an accident or something like that. Well, cable design turns out to not be an accident when it comes to the physical properties of how this stuff all goes together. Uh, it's kind of neat, and as a matter of fact, when you really see all this. Now, here's what I call proximity effect chart. That's not really right. That chart is really skin effect and proximity effect both, because I can't really pull them apart. Now, when I do the measurement, basically what I do is I hook a wire up to a high resolution LRC Hewlett Packard meter. And if you notice over on the far left, every single one of those traces is dead and the same. In other words, the resistance of iconoclast in 1313A, my reference, which is just a big 10 gauge multi-strand zip cord, they're the same, right? As I start to sweep them with respect to frequency, what you're gonna see is that red trace is my 1313A. Well, you can see that it starts to look like it's a resistively higher impedance circuit sooner than using multiple small wires. Why is that? Well, it's because that those two big wires aren't as efficient or as coherent with respect to frequency as long as multiple small wires are. So they don't go out as far in frequency before they start to act differently based on the frequency information. So hey, that's on a speaker cable. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we see that we're approaching three o'clock in 15 minutes and there's yeah. going to be some question and answer. Um, to get your story together, do you want to forward through a couple of slides or? Yeah, I can start speeding along quicker. And if you guys don't understand though, don't let me go faster than you can understand because that won't help you any. No, I think you're getting the points across, but um, relative to using the wires are what some of the questions that have come across and uh, on what you, feel is important to do regarding interactions, but right. I just want to, want to give a little time time awareness uh, so that we okay. can have questions. Well, unfortunately, all this does important because if you don't go around the whole Mobius strip, we won't really see how all this connects. And that's why this presentation is difficult, but yeah. we'll try to, I'll try to scoot along and get to what I really feel the important stuff is. Now, when we look at the, again, the sweat frequency responses, this is on the interconnect cable. And here we can see the same thing. We can have the 225 gauges, those are the upper two traces. And then if I go to the 430 gauges, you'll see that the proximity effect and skin depth effect makes the lower two traces flatter, more coherent, so to speak, more the same, more consistent out to a higher frequency, longer than the single wire design. And you can measure this. Now, on this particular cable, you should look at that though and say, well, gee, they're both flat roughly out to 20,000 kilohertz. So I don't really hear that. You don't. So don't think everything that's measurable is meaningful. 
this just so happens that it did improve the wire efficiency, but it's not the primary reason I use smaller wires. But this effect is boiled into there because if I improve something that I do feel is very important, it automatically improves this, even if it does push it further above, which I feel is inaudible. But it's there and you can measure it. All right. Now, here's kind of a little chart that's going to begin what we think of as, oh my God, what the hell is going on? Well, I said the inductance is consistent with frequency, and we see that it formally is. It's 0.08 to 0.07. Inductance is a very sensitive measurement, so the difference between 0.08 and 0.07 actually isn't as big as you think because how critical it is to measure. And to prove that point, if I measure my capacitance, notice it's 44.85, you know, whatever. I know my inductance and capacitance are pretty tightly associated with one another, so I know my inductance measurement is the one that has the highest standard deviation. My swept resistance, RS, that looks logical. We start at 2.37. We start to go up in frequency. We start to see that the skin effect and proximity effect make the wire look like it has a higher impedance, the higher in frequency we go. But check this out, guys. Look at the impedance. 297 ohms. And then it's only 40 ohms at, uh, you know, 100 megahertz. At 20 kilohertz, it's 43. I mean, what the heck's going on there? That's a mistake, right? Look at the phase. Mine is 43.81 degrees, highly capacitive. And as we go out to RF, all of a sudden it's negative 1.3 or basically DC, you know, in other words, it starts to get resistive. So this is an example of the fact that at through the audio frequency range, we have a cable that is highly reactive, minus 43 phase. We have a high impedance, 297. But as we go to RF, we see the phase response, say the cable's mostly resistive and our impedance magnitude drops significantly as that phase property disappears. So this is what we're stuck with in the audio band. That 297 ohms number is not a mistake, and we'll start to see that in a minute. Now, when we look at impedance, we have three different models to measure or actually calculate impedance. And remember, the physics makes the model. The model doesn't make the physics. These equations are designed to try to match the curves we measure when we actually get to stuff in the lab. I can't change this equation and make my measurements change, in other words. So the equations are always a curve fit type as close as we can get it. They're accurate through a certain range only. And in the transition regions, they're going to be less accurate and that data has to be thrown out. But as you can see, as we drop in frequency, and let's look at that 10 kilohertz range down on the left side of the graph, look what's happening to that line. It's going up. Precipitously, it's going up to 10,000 ohms in this particular example. And you're thinking, well, no, our cables match the impedance of our speakers because we all know an audio cable should be eight ohms into an eight ohm load, yada, yada, yada. Well, guess what, guys? I'm here to tell you that ain't how it's happening. Uh, and the physics will prove me out here. Now, let's look at some real cables. What do we see? We see the impedance on these cables are as high as you know 550 and over 700 ohms and that's down at one kilohertz hmm i guess that other graph was correct then these cables are going wacko on impedance at the low frequency ranges or are they remember no, mother nature doesn't do wacko only our expectations do wacko uh and of course we'll get upset about this but this is how this really occurs now remember the plain old telephone system stuff from bell labs Remember, you would hear them say, oh, this is a 600 ohm cable. Well, at one kilohertz, they were 600 ohms, right? This chart proves it. So from the old Bell Lab days, when you kept hearing about them talking about plain old telephone system cable being 600 ohms, people would keep thinking, oh, that's impossible. Then that, there's no cable that's really 600 ohms. Why did they say that? Well, they were saying that because their voice system was designed right around one kilohertz. And yes, indeed, those cables at 600 we're right at 600 ohms and they do something that most people designing these cables especially for the high-end audio audience don't really pay attention to the guys at bell labs did they knew exactly what these products were doing now if we look at iconoclast and this is a real measurement of iconoclast and 1313a the top two traces are phase now they're roughly 45 degrees a little less than 45 degrees at the far left of the trace right that means that cable is highly capacitive at the very low frequency end. That really should be a negative on the phaser, by the way, because capacitive is denoted by a negative sign. But if you notice, if you go to the right, where does it go? 
it goes almost all the way down to zero degree phase shift. That means our circuit is mostly resistive. Okay, so zero degrees means our cable isn't capacitive. It isn't really inductive, so to speak. The two are kind of balanced together so that they cancel each other. And the only thing left is resistance. Now look at our impedance. The 1313A is roughly 550, a little less than 550 ohms. Now in iconoclast, I've been able to reduce that to less than half, roughly down to you know, a little less than 300 or so. That's good, right? But it sure as hell is not two to 16 ohms, is it? But there's a reason it has to be there. And there's a reason that I think is why these cables sound so much different from one another. You cannot make a cable eight ohms. It, you, it just won't happen because of some slides we're gonna hit in just a second. Hey, Galen, um, yeah. I have a request to ask some questions and then we will continue the presentation maybe from here after we get through a few questions. Is that okay? Oh yeah, we can do that. Good deal. So uh, two people had similar questions and that is if you think uh, cable risers and support of the cable off the floor is an important thing to do uh, between uh, the amp and speaker. It is if you have a problem with magnetic interference. Cable risers will decrease the magnetic influence of power cables and things adjacent to low frequency cables by a square of the distance. So if you have, the first thing you do if you have hum in your system is you get your AC lines as far apart as you can from your interconnect. Even though a cable is shielded, like an interconnect, an RCA or an XLR, low frequency magnetic waves ignore those shields because they don't offer low permeability path to low frequencies. In other words, they don't block it, all right? So again, in audio, we kind of have a bum rap because the frequency range we're using can't be well shielded. Now, what shields audio cable would be a magnetic conduit, something a magnet sticks to. So a magnet is a good example of a low frequency B field. Well, 60 hertz is damn near a magnet. So if a magnet won't stick to the shield, aluminum, copper, it won't shield 60 hertz hum. You need to put it inside a material that iron sticks to. Your secondary defense, of course, if you can't do that, which most of it can't, is to move your cables apart from one another. Cable risers will do that, all right? Uh, so, you know, that's, for predominantly, that's what your cable risers are doing, and that helps reduce the overall noise level in your system. Uh, they did some tests that, played systems with an 80 dB signal to noise ratio, minus 80. Then they did a test with some stuff that had a minus 120 dB signal to noise ratio. They did this digitally because they can control the signal to noise ratio with digital really well. Uh, there's a way to manipulate the signal to noise ratio with digital. I'm sure there's some digital experts maybe listening today that'll explain that, but they can do it pretty precisely. But people could tell the difference between a minus 120 dB sound, so to speak, and the stuff that was at minus 80. Uh, and they did it with a high degree of accuracy. I wish I had the link to that test. Uh, so getting the noise level in your system down is important. So I use cable risers above my power cables to separate my AC and interconnect cables from one another. All right. And that's the predominant reason that I suggest using them. If your cables aren't near any power cables at all, I mean, knock yourself out if you want to, you know, but uh, I have seen no measurable data to suggest anything other than getting rid of EM interference in your cables from magnetic sources. So that's kind of my answer on that and how I use it in my own system. Thank you. And then um, there's a couple of questions about the interaction and it's exactly what you've been talking about, the interaction between the amplifier and the speaker and the network oh, yeah. design like MIT uses. MIT cable uses, and what do you think of that approach? Uh, I will get to that in the presentation. <laughs> I thought so. And uh, it will be quite uh, amazing what you see and how you start to interpret how all this stuff may be working for us or against us. So it, that, I'll have that in the presentation pretty quick here. As a matter of fact, I'm right at answering that question in the presentation. All right, then. And so um, I was asked to give a little description of what I've noticed using the cables when I plugged them in for the first time and try in May. And at that time I was using my big Carver amazing loudspeakers and they're a full range speaker. It was just one single set. I wasn't by wiring anything, but uh, I guess the comparison always is, is what you had before and what you're using next. And um, I had wire world cables and, uh, 
I know by the design, some people might say it's, it's very similar, but we know now when you look at the internals of what your cables are actually doing, it's very different. And the sound was very different too. Yes, it is. And you know, wire designers, there are a lot of good ones out there. They all have a slightly different fingerprint, if you know what I'm saying. A finger looks like a finger until you look at your fingerprint. Now they're all different. Uh, so there's different ways an engineer can balance what he's doing and why. I can only explain that design decisions I chose to make based on my knowledge base at Belden and 35 years of looking at this and doing it strictly from an engineering standpoint only, in other words. So uh, I use good materials, certainly do, but the material, I can put race car tires on my GTI, but it's not gonna beat my Porsche. Even if I put street tires on the Porsche, you know, the Porsche is just a fundamentally better design. Uh, audio cables are kind of like that. You really wanna get the design down first and materials really are secondary. Anybody can buy the materials that are in a Ferrari. Only Ferrari can make a Ferrari though. Yeah, well, that's a good way. We'll let you continue on in the presentation a little bit. One other question yeah, well, about the lifters and you're talking about separating the power cable from away your from, interconnects. From interconnects. Right, what? like your, your RCA especially. Uh, your yes. RCA cables don't have as good a noise mitigation as your XLR. Your XLR have an ability to cancel noise, but they're not perfectly balanced. They're almost perfectly balanced, but nothing is perfect. So it's still a good idea to remove XLR from magnetic noise. You don't want to aggravate it just for the hell of it, right? Uh, now, your RCA is sort of defenseless against magnetic noise, and the longer you go, the more defenseless it becomes because you have the wire, the resistance of the ground creates a down ground differential by the resistance of the brake, okay? So now you have two ground points between two pieces of equipment that we purposely made one higher and one lower, which creates current flow in the braid, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that creates noise. And when you put magnetic interference onto the braid, it's gonna go to the lowest end of the cable, wherever the ground's lower. That's gonna be multiplied by the resistance of your shield, and that's gonna create the hum that you hear. All right, that's an RCA cable by design. The only way to mitigate that is with a very, very low braid DCR so that the current in the braid generated by magnetic interference is a low number. If my braid had no resistance, E equals I times R, and if R is zero, then my noise generated in the braid is zero, right? But we can't do that, copper has a resistance. So we always compromise our ground plane uniformity when we use an RCA cable. So RCAs particularly aren't very good at long runs, even though in theory, they're a more pristine voltage transfer medium because they're perfectly balanced. You got a center conductor relative to a shield. An XLR cable, however, has two differential current paths. You have a physical structure that's much more complex. It needs to be geometrically identical to perfectly cancel noise. They can't be perfectly geometrically perfect, by the way. So you also have two op amps or a transformer it has to be round perfectly to develop two differential voltages. All those things can go wrong or be slightly off. The advantage, however, is the general noise that an XLR will generate is always the same because the common mode rejection ratio of an XLR doesn't change with the noise level, okay? So they're much more consistent in terms of their ability to remove noise all the time. And RCA isn't. And that's why the pros like XLRs. They can plug an XLR in and know that they're gonna get generally very good noise rejection first. Sound quality is important, but noise is first because if you have noise, how good the signal sounds over the noise isn't going to do anybody any good because no one's going to listen to it. So noise is first. And with some of the new Iconoclast BAB series cables we've developed for the pro market, we've allowed them to not only get low noise reduction, but really good sounding cables compared to what we used to make as well. So do you think kind of cable, why... do you think cable lifters are necessary for the speaker cables? Uh, no, okay, not really. But still, keep your power away from everything as best you can. I yeah, mean, now you're asking. You yeah, now remember, back. guys, you're asking me what I think. Yeah. Uh, based on my engineering background, and I think that RCA cables, in particular, need to be kept away from your power cables. XLRs don't aggravate it. Keep those away too. Speaker cables, not so much. You have massive amounts of current in a speaker cable that just dwarf any noise products by, uh, in other words, your signal rate to noise ratio in a speaker cable is way over 100 dB. Okay. That's yeah, good. the signal's massive. You, it's just, it's just like, it's, 
it'd be like the guy talking in a dorm room in downtown Oxford interfering with my presentation a mile from town. The noise is there, but you can't hear it. All right, if anyone yeah. has other questions, throw it on the chat and I'll get them to Galen. We're gonna let him continue on with his presentation. Now, this graph is kind of interesting. This is at RF, and this is to prove, by the way, what happens somewhat back into the audio range. Kind of, we're gonna fold this back into the audio range. Now, what this is, this is a graph of the amount of energy that's reflected off the load in an audio or in an RF cable. This happens to be a 100 ohm ethernet cable. And remember what I said, that a load won't be transferred 100% efficiently if it has a reactive component to it. In other words, if it's capacitive or inductive, when that signal gets to that 100 ohm resistor that's on your network interface card, that resistor is going to look at the inductance and capacitance. And it's going to say, buddy, you're storing voltage. Get out of here. Inductor, you're storing current. Get out of here. Come back to me later when you can resistively convey your signal. But I don't want it right now. So what happens is the signal reflects back off the load and goes down the cable. And this is exemplified by this chart. The return loss numbers on the bottom of the chart are a logarithmic measure of the magnitude of the current that's reflecting off the load. If we look at the far left on the 100 ohm line, we can see that there's a blue dot right at what, minus 55? Well, every 10 dB is a decade, so it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, five times, plus a little more, and that's the magnitude of the energy that's being reflected off the load. In other words, it's really darn small. That's when the cable is almost perfectly 100 ohm resistive. That's a really good number. But as we can see, the cable is mostly close to 100 ohms, not exact. And as we go more towards the right side of the trace, we see that more and more energy is actually reflected backwards down the cable. But the funny thing is, guys, is if we look at the 100 ohm line, like we've always been told to think, how come we got cable that's a 100 ohm line that's all the way to the left that has about minus 25, minus 23 dB of SRL? That's 100 ohm cable, isn't it? It is, but it's more reactive. There's more capacitance. Even though it's at the same 100 ohm vector magnitude, it's comprised of more reactive components. Therefore, we don't get as efficient transfer of the load. Now at RF, the other thing that occurs is if you're above or below the impedance, we will also see higher return loss. So as you go above and below, you'll start to see that those higher impedance values at 120 and minus 90, they don't have as good a RL as that guy way over there at the minus 55 range either. But you can get values at 120 that have lower return loss than values that are at minus 110, primarily because of the composition of the impedance vector real versus what's called reactive component. Now, if we bear that in mind and we go to audio, let's look at what a speaker does. Now, I don't want to pick on a speaker I haven't owned in case it makes somebody mad, but this is a C4. I own these speakers for a while. These are, this is a very nice speaker for the money. I was quite smitten with them. But if we look at this impedance and the phase, now, what the phase is, is a trace, the dotted line, of how much energy a speaker wants to store. Amplifiers do not like driving into reactive loads. They like to see the, the power go out, and they don't want to be talked back to. They don't want to see that energy through what's called back EMF come backwards through the cable back at the amp. Amps aren't designed to receive power. They're designed to send it. They do mitigate things in amps with negative feedback and the like to tolerate it, but that's not. That's not what amps are meant to do. So if you have a very high reactive load with a very low impedance, the amplifier has to develop a ton of current. And when it develops a ton of current and throws it back to the speaker, the, re the low reactance of the speaker or the high reactance actually at that point makes it reflect a maximum amount of energy back at the amplifier. The frequency it does this at is really critical because of where that power distribution is. And if we look at this trace, we can see if you go to around, oh, what is it? Maybe 80 ohms or so, we can see a spot in there where the speaker is like maybe five ohms, and we have more than minus 45 degrees of phase shift. So the amplifier is delivering a ton of power because it's a very low resistance, okay? And we have a ton of reactance that is at a very low frequency range. Well, is that a problem? And why is that a problem? Now, if we have a lot of phase angle, 
and we have a high impedance, the high impedance helps lower the amount of power that's actually being distributed because it's a higher resistance. So the amplifier can tolerate that a little better because there's less current being driven at that point. But here's a trace that Paul put out. His trace is better than mine, so I asked him if I could use it. But this is what's actually happening, you guys. If you look at your stereo, you got a thousand watts being distributed in this particular captured trace at 50 hertz. Think about that, a thousand watts. Now, if we drop down in frequency, not very far, we can see it drops down to only 15 watts. And then if we go out to the higher frequencies, roughly 2K or so, we see it drop to one watt. If you're going to try to match a cable's impedance to your speaker, it's better to do it at the low frequency range than the high frequency range, because that's where the most power is being distributed. That's where you're going to get the most reflections off of your speaker. And that's what's going to drive your amplifier the most batshit when it's trying to drive these reactive loads. But what did I show you earlier? I showed you that the impedance of the speaker, where we want it to be lowest, is going highest. That's terrible. But that is indeed what Mother Nature has thrown us with when we try to design audio cables. So we need to figure out a way to make that work to our advantage somehow by looking at all variables involved in how these cables are working. Now, why does the impedance go so high when we go lower in frequency, though? That, you know, what's the deal? Well, first thing you need to remember. The velocity of propagation of DC is zero. The signal's always there. It's not alternating, right? So there is no speed at which you measure the maximum and then the minimum and then the maximum and then the minimum. There is no phase reversal in DC. So by definition, the velocity of DC is zero. Well, it makes sense then that as you approach DC, what is the velocity of propagation in a cable gonna do? It's gonna start to approach zero and it does. Here's a trace of four cables. Now, a lot of audio cable designers, cable you know, people out there, will sell you what the mitigating resistance of velocity is at the RF. Look at 9209. I could tell you, honestly, I could say, oh yeah, the velocity of propagation of that cable is about 83%. Well, if I look at the left-hand side of the trace, I can see that it drops to, it's the second worst out of the four at one kilohertz. Well, that's where we're using the cable, isn't it? We're using it below 20 kilohertz, yet it's one of the worst of the four, but at RF, it's the best. So do not pay any attention to the RF velocity factors. They're meaningless through the audio band because of the way the cables design and behave. And you can see all of these cables have different traces and they're all explainable by the design choices that they made when they designed the product in terms of its resistance and capacitance. Here's another paper showing the same thing. Velocity factor, look at the percent, okay? The minute we start going from RF where it's virtually the same, like I mentioned earlier in your presentation, but when we get to audio down in the, you know, the, you got your 10 squared, you got your 10 to the four. So your, you know, your 20K is well in that zone where that line is plummeting. And everyone's gonna look at that and go, oh my God, why? You know, we can't have that, but what that says is every single frequency in your cable is traveling to the end of that wire at a different speed. So even if you have no phase at the beginning of the cable, you have a perfect phase property DAC, you know, DAC or whatever it might be, and we'd line up all the signals perfectly. The minute they start going down the cable, every frequency is every man for himself based on the frequency, and they all start to travel at different speeds. So you got cable that we're all, you got, People that are going 10 miles an hour, you know, on up to say 50 miles an hour, but the farther they go, the more they get time shifted. Now your ear is very sensitive to what we sound like based on the harmonic structure, the information that we receive. That's why you can tell who's calling you on a phone. That's why we can tell who has a cold. That's why a cello sounds different than a violin. You have a fundamental frequency and you have overtones. All those overtones and how they're associated with the primary fundamental is how we identify music. So anything that shifts the overtones from the fundamental will change how our music sounds. And through the audio band, our cable, unfortunately, is doing it in a way we don't want it to. We want, we want those overtones and fundamentals to be on the record or the, or the digital source. We don't want our cable to be tone controls, which, of course, people have always said these cables are tone controls depending on how you design them. They really are, by the way, to an extent. 
But that's why I think you're starting to hear a lot of the differences in the audio cables. Now, it just so happens that impedance at the low frequency range is calculated using the velocity. And it's a constant basically divided by the velocity factor with some other mitigating you know, numbers in there. But basically, long story short, when the velocity goes down through the audio range, it automatically forces the impedance to go up. There's nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen, and it ain't going to be anywhere close, all right, to 5 ohms, OK? Now, let's go back here, though, and look at that one trace once more, because I told you I was going to point something out. Remember the other trace we looked at from QED that showed the phase characteristics at 20 kilohertz was around, what was it, 7%, I think it was, right? Somebody correct me if I'm misquoting that, but somewhere around 5 to 7. Well, let's look at this trace and let's go to roughly where 20 kilohertz is and go up. And what we can see on this trace is it looks like it's saying the phase is somewhere in the vicinity of somewhere south of 10 degrees. This trace on iconoclast cable, based on its inductive properties, is showing the phase shift about the same as where that range was shown in the QED slide. So if someone says, oh, I don't think that QED slide is right, this is an independent set of measurements, and it does show fundamentally that you're going to get a phase at 20 kilohertz, somewhere around a little less than 10 degrees phase shift. All right, so we're starting to see that that sort of verifies that QED source as far as what they measure. Now, I'm not saying that saying that inductance specifically lowers your phase, but that charge isn't wrong in terms of where the phase actually is on an average speaker cable. But remember what I also said, it's not the same except at 20 kilohertz. As you can see, as you go to the left, the phase starts to change as well, okay? So that is also accurate. Now, what can we do with what we just looked at? And this is the cool part of this stuff when you really start to study it. If you look at the equation for the velocity of propagation through the audio band, we get this guy. We get VP, velocity of propagation, equals 2 times omega. Omega is 2 pi f, by the way, divided by resistance times capacitance. Hey, guess what, you guys? We have resistance. We have capacitance, right? I, as a designer, can choose what those things are and what that does to the velocity of propagation through the audio band, right? Now, if you go real high in frequency, the VP is just one over the square root of L times C. Do you see anything in there with regard to resistance per se, you know, and the reactive effects? No, because when you go out to RF, everything just flattens out. It's basically, another way you could write that VP actually equals one divided by the square root of the dielectric constant. That's another way to write it. But that basically is saying that, you know, we got a free ride at RF, everything's the same. Our VP has omega in it, which is 2 pi f. We have frequency in there. So every single frequency has a different velocity of propagation. So that's what the math is telling us. Now, if we fiddle with the math, I can basically look at it one of two ways. I can fix the resistance, which is what I've done in this chart, and I can vary the capacitance. Look what it does to the VP, and that's through up to 20 kilohertz. That's through the audio band. That's not cheating. That's not out to above what we can hear, you can see that there's a marked difference in the velocity of propagation. I can't fix the low end. Physics says it's going to go to zero because by definition, zero hertz is 0% VP. Well, 20 is close to zero, so it's going to have a very low velocity of propagation. And we see that in this chart. There's no way around it. Now, before you get too freaked out, 10% of the speed of light is still pretty speedy, you guys. And our cables aren't very long. So if you look at the numbers mathematically and look at the time differential, even though they seem severe on this chart on a percent scale, they're roughly 30% or more, on an absolute basis, the numbers appear to be, quote, too small to hear. You know, you can lie two ways. You can say COVID has killed 245,000 people or whatever it is, or you can say it's killed one half of 1%, which sounds like a whole lot less people. So you got to be careful sometimes how you look at the data. All right, but if there's anything in audio cables that I think is really messed up, it is that we don't pay enough attention to the VP linearity or coherence through the audio band by working with this equation. 
Uh, and you can manipulate this with the various variables and kind of make it do what you want to do. And we'll see a little bit how I did that. Now, here's another way you can do it. I can change the gauge size and hold the capacitance constant. So in this particular slide, I held the capacitance at about 15, a realistic number, but I let the gauge size vary from 30 gauge to 24 gauge. Look at the difference between a 25 gauge even and a 30 gauge. There's a difference of a little over 0.5, you know, 0.55 percent VP, and down to like three, you know, 0.3. So there's a significant change in the velocity of propagation. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm trying to flatten that curve to add what I call coherence. In other words, make it look close as you can to the same at all frequencies, even if even though I can't really do it but I can get close. I can try to get there and improve the situation that mother nature's kind of dealt us. Now, here's what people have asked about amps just a minute ago. Your amplifier does not like to drive a reactive load. If you put enough capacitance on an amplifier, you will move what's called a pole filter. And if you use a what's called a Bode plot that basically tells you mathematically when will that amplifier turn into an oscillator based on the amount of stored energy in that signal? And remember, stored energy doesn't go away. It starts to do something. Well, alternating current stored oscillates. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And it sits there and oscillates. A resistive load can't do that because the energy disappears into the load and turns into heat or work. Moving your speaker back and forth, your voice coil gets hot. It all disappears. But when an amplifier has too much stored energy, in the line, the amplifier will actually start turning into an oscillator. So you don't want to put a lot of capacitance on an amplifier, or you at least, if you're going to, you need an amplifier that's specifically designed to somehow remove that with negative feedback or something. But fundamental rule though, is don't put capacitors on your amplifier. Now, your speaker wants low impedance, but if I lower my impedance, the equation say I need to raise the capacitance but I can't get to eight ohms, all right? My speaker cable is around 300 ohms at the very low frequency range, what do you do? So you're at a quandary to decide why am I going where I'm going in terms of what sounds good. My experience has indicated to me that VP linearity is extremely important, and yet you do want to match the impedance and the like as well as you can to the load. Uh, so you gotta do it two different ways, depending on if you're looking at a speaker cable or an interconnect cable. Now, on a speaker cable, if we go back to uh, the original equation right here, 2 pi RC, on a speaker cable, I generally want to have low inductance, yet if I want to lower the VP linearity, what that tells me to do is I need to raise the capacitance because I need the resistance low because I don't want the, you know, that's what's lowering my VP. So on a speaker cable, my resistance is so low to avoid dropping voltage across it and making sure the voltage gets to the load. My alternative there is I have to do something with capacitance then to lower the VP. Because remember, I already said earlier in our presentation, I wanna keep my R really low, but a really low R, according to this equation, will make the VP linearity worse. Well, I, I raised the C, so I let the C go up to 45 picofarads in this type of product on purpose but I don't let it go so high as to cause amplifier instability. So that's the reason I chose 45 picofarads in the speaker cable is I want that VP linearity to be really decent. And I don't want the cable to see a lot of voltage dropped across it. That way I can keep the R low. On my interconnect cable, interconnect cables are a voltage transfer product. So they don't transfer current because they're going into theoretically an infinite open impedance they're going into a 47 K ohm resistor. So they don't have much current. So on an interconnect cable, I wanna keep the capacitance reasonably low. So I keep C low, 17 and a half or 12 and a half picofarads per foot. So how do I get good velocity of propagation linearity in an interconnect cable? Well, you guessed it. I make the R go up. I use a 25 gauge conductor or I use four tiny 30 gauge conductors, which in further improves the VP, VP linearity. So Every cable can use this equation to kind of achieve a good VP linearity and improve it, but you sort of have to know going in where you're going with R and C. You just can't let it, you have to design it. You have to make it work for you in order to touch on all of these points.
okay? Now, the last point real quick is wire. What's the deal with wire? Let's go to this slide, which is a little better. The ability to reduce the number of grains in wire is directly proportional to your draw speed. The slower you draw the wire, the less grains you have, but time is money. So it costs a lot more money when you slow the draw process and make the drains, you know, the grains in the wire more uniform. So if you look at this chart on the top, the stuff on the far upper left has more grains. And as you go to the right, you'll see that the grains line up parallel and the grains are longer. Sometimes you'll hear copper called long grain copper. All that means is the orientation of the grains have gone from parallel across the wire to laterally up and down the wire, okay? We use TPC, okay, and our wire with silver plate or non. I don't use what's called OFHC. That has about 300 grains per unit. I go to the OFE, which is around 70. That's technically called long grain copper. And then you have what's called ultra pure OCC that is pulled really slow, so slow as a matter of fact, that it is actually considered single grain copper. Uh, that's very expensive, but I can't get that wire on long enough lengths to make bonded pair, high speed uh, bonded pair that's used in the speaker cables. But remember, it turns out with most of our testers, the design of the product far eclipses the quote wire in the cable. Now, none of this wire is bad quality, by the way. Modern induction furnace wire is all really, really good. If you look at the resistivity, which is that little red line in the bottom trace, you'll see that it's in, you know, milli Siemens okay, per meter, but you'll see that they really had to expand that graph out so you can even see the difference because the difference is like what? It's showing. Right sake, it's like 59, and I think it drops down to 59.0 from 59.5. So they really had to expand that graph out to make it look, quote, like a lot. It really isn't. So the resistivity is not there. Now, the grains, however, somehow or another, do change the electromagnetic field at any given point in time in terms of how that EM field is created and superimposed on one top of one another at any point in time. Because remember, all those current paths in that wire, based on the current efficiency, will affect that. Now, as you use smaller and smaller wire, and the wire efficiency improves, the effect of how the copper is made actually becomes less and less important because, of course, you have fewer and fewer uh, current paths through that wire. So you have less distortion caused by the construction of the wire. So if you use really small wires, all right, and you use good quality wire to begin with, the design actually eclipses more what the system sounds like, all right, predominantly than the wire. Although the wire does change the sound of the, of the cable. I have people that have used it on this side on purpose to attest to that. You can hear a difference, even though the measured R, L, and C is all mathematically and statistically the same. You're gonna get 45 plus or minus five, you're gonna get 0.08 plus or minus 0.1. The wire from that aspect is all going to measure the same. So wire does affect the sound slightly, but nobody has developed a test that we can measure, so to speak, to conclusively prove exactly what the grain structure of the wire is doing. I don't think it's resistivity, you guys, because resistivity is resistance, and that's a passive distortion. It's just like moving your volume knob up and down. So it has to do with the time-based interval of how the electromagnetic wave is being comprised by all the electrons traveling down the wire, each one, of course, creating a magnetic wave that if you take a snapshot in time, they all superimpose on top of one another and they mathematically add up because you only have one voltage on your speaker terminals at a time, okay? It's like a square wave though. We know it's comprised of many, many, many sine waves, but it's still one voltage. And if you change the phase, of any of those signals at any point in time, that electromagnetic wave's amplitude will be altered. And that altered amplitude due to the change in phase of the signals that comprise it is what makes the imaging and the sound quality of our cables or anything, well, be different because that's what your ears are hearing, okay? Kalen, there's one question and then uh, someone else is gonna moderate, I have to run. But the, the question is, if you want to improve audio, this is from Jan, if you want to improve audio, will you get more out of upgrading interconnects or the speaker cables? 
a speaker cable. Here's why. When you use a speaker cable, remember what I showed you on my that C4 graph, how radically wild the impedance trace looks? It's pretty wild and woolly, and all speakers are different, but they all fundamentally do that. There's some better than others, but the impedance of a speaker is pretty ratty. And then you look at the output properties of your amplifier, and all amplifiers have different damping factors at different frequencies. Plus, when you look at the measurements of your amp, they're derived measuring a resistor, not a reactive load. And the reason that's true is because the loads are so varied, they wouldn't know what reactive load to use to give you an idea of what it does anyway. So they standardized around a resistor and kind of said, well, whatever L and C you hook on this amplifier, well, you know, sucks to be you kind of a thing. So a speaker cable has the hardest job. It can't match an amp. Like I said earlier, it can't be zero reactance, but it can't match a speaker either and be such a thing as eight ohms. So a speaker cable is always gonna have the biggest change in the network between the amp, cable, and speaker. Interconnect cable is a little easier. They're going into, in essence, a infinity load. So the load is always the same, right? So the only thing that will change the sound of an interconnect cable is the actual balanced circuit that's driving it or the unbalanced circuit in the case may be. So its job's a lot more consistent, okay? So that's why I say if you're gonna try one or another, you'll probably hear the biggest difference between speaker cables. Now that's not true in all systems, but I'd say it's mostly true most of the time is that amp speaker uh, cable combinations are a lot more difficult as a network than an interconnect cable is. I noticed the most difference with the speaker cables, but the speaker cables really allow me to notice when I change my interconnects too. I agree. Yes. That if you get that window really transparent that you can all of a sudden hear the interconnects, yeah. But again, an interconnect cables into a very high impedance load all the time with everybody's equipment. So our load is more of a known. Uh, the load a speaker cable goes into is a much higher unknown at all, and it varies with frequency. The load doesn't vary with frequency on an interconnect because it's going into a high resistive load. It's always the same. So that's a huge advantage. In other words, the coherence of the load on an interconnect is really good. The coherence of the load on the speaker cable is really bad. And so is the load that the amplifier is looking at is really bad. So, you know, but... Uh, so well, yeah. you guys continue on and have fun. I wish I could stay. But uh, thank you very much, Galen, and everyone for attending. Enjoy the rest. I'm going to run. Uh, no, we just we just finished up. Believe it or not, we're at the we're at the questions. One of them is, how many pennies does that roll of stem pack wire produce, and how much would that be? Oh, I got to go. I can't play. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> I don't know the answer either, but there's a whole lot of money sitting right there. Okay, a hundred, try like a, probably a hundred million pennies. That's 1200 or that's 12,000 pounds of wire sitting there. Hmm. There's a, that's a bunch of copper. That's an 18 gauge. We, we get it in the plant and they draw it to 18 gauge and it goes on what's called a giant stem pack. And the wire's pulled off of there and it's drawn down further from 18 gauge at each extruder down to the gauge that's necessary for whatever we're making. But yeah, there's a lot of copper sitting there. Hey, Galen. So yeah. Um, Brian Wilson, we brought him on because he auditioned your cables. He has a question for you and he wanted to talk a little bit about his experience with them. So okay. Brian, are you, can you talk now? I certainly can. Okay. I see Brian, you're there, but. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, oh, there we go. Yes, I can yep. hear you. I don't yeah, know. Go ahead. Am I unmuted is the question. Yes, <laughs> yes you are unmuted. unmuted. Wonderful. Well, Galen, thank you so much. This is an unbelievable session. And I I love that you're a, a data-driven objectivist. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, by training, but you know, I hope to convey to people that if you do design audio per the math and the science that it can produce good results. For some reason, speaker cable or audio cable in general has just kind of got, gone off on a weird direction that anything goes. And that to me is insulting as an engineer. Uh, I can't say that I'm an audio holic protagonist, but their site does show nice data, mind you. Where I think they go off the rails though, is if you listen to these cables, they are different. 
So even though the numbers are, that you produce are right, and any number in and of itself seems too small to matter, when you build a cable and optimize each one, kind of like what I demonstrated, cable designers do, it does make a difference in how they move information from A to B. It, it really does. And it is really demonstrable how these products differ. And I can take any cable and do the same analysis I've done here and kind of give you an idea you know, of what the designer's done or hasn't done. It's in the numbers. It, it's like, again, it's spaghetti sauce. It's in there. Well, I've, I've had the privilege of evaluating the OFE and SPTPC speaker cables for a few weeks. Uh, with some really surprising learnings uh, this month. Uh, my system briefly is uh, uh, Tannoy uh, Prestige uh, speakers, so I, I really can hear the difference between wires. I, I have balanced differential monoblock amps. I have a high-end lumen streamer as my source, so I, I, I can change a cable and instantly hear the difference. Um, it probably won't surprise you that I, I had a clear preference for the silver plated TPC versus the OFE, but where things got really interesting was when I uh, evaluated bywire configurations. Uh, in my case, Tanoi provides uh, silver jumpers uh, for people that don't use two sets of wires. So I compared running your SPTPC directly to the uh, low frequency posts and jumpering to the tweeter. I, I tried the opposite. And then I tried a hybrid that was recommended online where I put one leg of each speaker connection uh, onto you know, a, a tweeter and a woofer, if you will, and jumpered the opposite. And of those um, permutations, clear preference with your cable on the woofer terminals. I, I, I was truly astounded uh, that, that the hybrid of, of one positive and one negative uh, was a regression. It, it sounds better to use silver jumpers to the tweeter and run your cable to the woofer. And, and that piqued my curiosity to use my lower, my loner OFE cable for the low frequency runs and the silver plated TPC for the high frequency runs. And, and that's my favorite of all. And that doesn't surprise me at all. My long winded question is, does your data support uh, in a in a bi wired configuration with separate runs? Does your data support using OFE for the lows and SPTPC for the highs, <laughs> or would ideally the type of copper be the same throughout? Conceptually, it does. From a measure the data and look at the numbers standpoint, it doesn't. Now, what I mean by that is that the low frequencies, your signal is completely diffusion coupled through the wire pretty well, okay? Meaning the wire is current efficient. That thin layer of silver plating on there, this is a true story about how this came to be. This is kind of interesting. I silver plated the TPC with super high 10 gigahertz precision wire to basically see if I could get a crappy soldering iron I had at home to flow lead or lead free silver solder better, WBT silver solder. Silver generally allows copper, you know, and soldering to flow smoother and at a lower temperature. Well, it was primarily done for workability and it worked, it did flow much better. But when I had my beta testers listen to the TPC and the SPTPC, which I theoretically said shouldn't sound any different, the beta testers all said, oh my God, Galen, this expensive wire, even though it's the same TPC core, it just sounds so much better. There's more open, it's quiet or something's weird. I don't know. And I thought, well, gee, Merry Christmas. So I set my system up, took all my wiring out, put in this, and I listened. And I'm like, son of a gun, it sounds different. Now what? 
Well, the beta tester said, well, what do you mean now? What, just let people buy it? And I said, well, this wire is kind of expensive since it's super precision, 10 gigahertz wire made for super high frequency coaxial cables. The best wire you can buy as far as dimensions go, in other words. But we made the decision to offer it. Now, that coating is only 40 micro inches thick, which means the highest fundamental frequency in music is what, 9.6 kilohertz, somewhere just under 10 kilohertz, okay? There's no fundamental higher than that. Meaning anything above 10 kilohertz is a fundamental attached to the, or it's a harmonic attached to the fundamental. The only thing that silver plating can be doing is manipulating how those higher frequency harmonics are heard. And the only way they can do that to any extent whatsoever is at a higher and higher frequency. Now remember, 20 kilohertz isn't really high. The skin depth of audio is still a good 18, 20 mils, somewhere in there. That's a lot deeper than 40 micro inches. So your mind would say that silver can't help except workability and how well it solders, but it does. Now that said, as you go lower in frequency, you're fully diffusion coupled for sure, meaning the OFE at the low frequency end, I can probably tell you, you can put any cable on your low frequency terminals and probably not hear any difference at all in the base. But that does not seem to be the case if you hook it up to your mid tweeter. There is a definite difference in the tonal balance between OFE, SPTPC, and TPC. Okay, so for a lot of people that have by wire, I suggest that you may want to investigate the TPC on your low end or the OFE. Actually, I'd use the TPC, to be honest with you, and use the SPTPC for your upper end. But you do know what by wire is doing, right? It's doing a couple things. It lowers your intermodulation distortion. Remember I told you that your signal on your terminals is one voltage at any instant in time, but it's a superposition of all the voltages that the music is comprised of at any in its instant in time. When you add a whole bunch of frequencies together, you can create what's called beat frequencies. In other words, frequencies that weren't originally in the original data set. That's called distortion, and they call that intermodulation distortion. Uh, if you read the stereo review reviews on the things, you'll see that they take a 19 kilohertz tone and a 20 kilohertz tone and they put them in a device at the exact same time. Have you seen those traces? And then on either side of the trace, you'll see this other stuff show up and that's artificial interference called intermodulation distortion. So they test equipment to see how poorly it does when two frequencies are added together at the same instant in time. How much extra garbage does it create? Well, our speaker cables do the same thing when we put all the music together in one set of leads. We have a whole lot of frequencies that we add together and that creates IM distortion. And the number of frequencies we put together determines how much of it we get. If you separate the low frequencies from the high frequencies, we now have taken that wad of frequencies and split it into two, each having less than they were together. So we have less frequencies, we have less beat frequencies, we have less intermodulation distortion. The other thing by wire does, is it separates the back EMF from your woofer from the driver that's going to your mid tweeter so that it improves your mid range and tweeters linearity and response because you don't have this back EMF energy going back and forth in your mid range tweeter signals nearly as much as you do your woofer. Why? Your mid range and tweeter look more resistive, which means you get less reflections because it looks more like a resistive load, which is what transfers energy better. Your woofer, on the other hand, looks like a very reactive load, like the traces we looked at today. So you get a lot of energy that's moving around. It can't quite be used up yet because it's reactive. It's storing current or voltage, and it's, it's, you know, it's creating back EMF when that happens. Uh, so that, you don't want to get mixed up with your mid-tweeter. So that also improves the way your instruments and your music sounds with mid-range tweeter. Bass has a lot of distortion in it anyway, so it's better to hide it there. And by wiring kind of hides that problem so you don't hear it as much. Still there, mind you, but you don't hear it as much. Now, what you also can get rid of that's true is the IM distortion. There is a difference in the IM distortion that's real when you separate those frequencies. The back EMF stays the same. You just move it out of one set of leads in your mid range tweeter and you isolate it to the woofer. So that's what by wire does for you if you never really looked at that well that was that was my motivation to invest in the mit technology because those those little uh, mystery black boxes at each end of the speaker cable turn out to be lc networks so yeah, they, they kind of give it away when they call them poles of articulation 
Yep. And a pole basically is just a mathematical name for a reactive uh, pole filter that basically tries to move resonant frequencies out of the pass band of the information that's being put on the cable. Okay, now I chose to make cables that are truly just passive and don't rely on poles and filters because remember that's taking a guess as to what your load is gonna be and they don't really know, it's a guess. Uh, and a lot of people think Zobel networks cancel reactive information and it really doesn't. What a Zobel network does is it tries to smooth out the way your speaker looks to your amp by making the lower frequency region look less reactive. And that generally has to be matched to the speaker itself. So the Zobel network always will be different depending on the brand of the speaker you build. Some speakers have a Zobel network already built into them, okay, from the factory, for instance. So, but that's not really designed to solve cable problems, if you know what I'm saying. A lot of people think the Zobel network is designed to solve cable problems. No, it doesn't. It solves a low frequency a uh, non-linearity problem that the speaker is presenting to your amplifier. The speaker cable, you certainly don't want it to aggravate it, which is why I try to keep capacitance and inductance low. I don't really recommend people use cables that are really low inductance with high capacitance or really low capacitance with high inductance because you're really putting a component now on your amp speaker interface, not really a cable. A cable should be zero R, L, and C across the board. The minute you start to put high Cs and low Ls and all that on there, now you're putting network components between your amp and speaker. And you can blow up your amps and cause lots of problems doing that. Well, with, so a, nod, I, with a nod to the monkeys, I'm, I'm a believer, Galen. Well, it, 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 they are what they are. Uh, I mean, there's stuff the Cables sound fantastic. Believe. The, the specific kudos for increasing clarity without making the system sound etched uh, and major kudos for the sound stage. I've, I've never heard my room sound so wide and so deep, but the, the width is particularly jaw dropping. And that's what I heard when I first put these speakers in my system is what I call the image specificity which has all got to do with phasing, by the way, found it so much better and so much more real, so much more relaxing because everything was just right there. I could hear the image placement front to back. It wasn't like headphones where you have this weird oral effect where you can hear it. But I mean, do you get floaters in your eyes when you look at a white piece of paper and when you look at it, it moves? Well, my music was like that with my old cable. It imaged, but if I tried to concentrate on the image, it's like it wouldn't stay still the iconoclast design seems to have cemented everything in place across the sound stage, left to right, front to back. And it's just almost like everything just went into focus. And if you ask me an opinion on what is doing that, I think it has more to do with the VP linearity adjustments that I've chosen to do than about anything else studying these things. Now that doesn't mean skin depth isn't doing anything. That doesn't mean proximity effects doing nothing. That just says, I really think the thing that might be doing the most is the VP linearity, but that's the hardest thing to do because you have to know you're doing it from the get-go, yet you have to do it without ruining everything else in the cable. And third, you have to make compromises on where you let the inductance and capacitance go on every design to achieve it. Uh, and that's kind of what's patented, by the way, is the ability to kind of look at all of these variables specifically for our guys, you know, us hobbyists with audio, and make a cable that's legitimately better design. Now, people can say I'm a quack all they want, but the numbers will support, you know, how the cables are designed. But if someone says, yeah, the cables are definitely better, but I can't hear it, I'm okay with that though, because the cable isn't changing. It still will be superior to our standard products. It's not cheap to make them, but it's definitely more superior and I think well-designed cable for our audio. And of course, the designs I made or the changes I made, as real as they may be, Another cable designer may make just as real changes, but decide, well, I think your passings really should be 15. I think the inductance should be 0.12. Here's why. I don't have a problem with that, but just make sure the people that make your cable have a reason as to why they're arriving at our L and C and why they're doing it and can explain it to you. And everything with cables is fat, dumb, and happy as far as I'm concerned. So we're not there yet. Uh, I may be sticking out my neck by explaining how I design cables and why. Maybe you're not supposed to do that in this industry, but well, looks like I've done it, so. 
Okay, well, you've, you've gotten everybody really, really interested in wanting to try out your cables. So do you know the ones that we have that I think are going around as loners? Brian, what are the cables? Do you know what they are? Which ones? Uh, they are two six foot length sets uh, of speaker cable, one with the silver plated TPC, SPTPC, and the other is the OFE. Uh, and it is uh, locking bananas at both ends. Uh, it's my understanding yeah, Iconoclast likes spades, mm -hmm. which is what I'll be ordering. The loners have wonderful locking bananas. Now, can you see me, guys, with what I'm showing you? Yeah, Galen, un unshare your screen and then we could see you more. Unshare it. Yeah, just so we can, then you'll be bigger because you're still screen sharing. So. Okay, so stop sharing. There we yeah, go. Yeah, there we go. That's now, much, now we can see you better. Okay, we have a, what's called a ultrasonic, not sonic, ultrasonically welded spade, big heavy spade. And it basically it has a footer that goes down into this shape conductor. And it basically presses down on there and it puts ultrasonic frequencies through there that makes the wire vibrate and it generates heat. And then it literally welds itself to the part. This is better than soldering because you got 24 wires in here and you need to silver solder with the propane torch. It takes skill to do it. Not that that's not good, but a person with a lever and a footer does it the same every time, right? Gauge R and R is perfect. The other design that also uses ultrasonic welding inside, okay? These guys are also ultrasonically welded and these are locking. There's the- Caleb, there's can a you hold them up higher? We can't see them. Oh, there we go, that's better. There we go. So these have a pin inside here that as you screw this forward, it forces a pin out here, which expands this and it locks that into your back of your speaker, okay? The best banana ever. And this is a banana on these guys. And we had to specially have these designed because the shape of this had to be specially made for the ultrasonic welder. These dies are actually really expensive, as you know, because of metal and the stuff they need to be made out of to tolerate the pressure and the heat they generate. They're made out of like titanium and some other crazy stuff, but they're basically like 15,000 bucks a set. They're really expensive. So uh, we had these specially designed, but the customers really oh, enjoy these. Salem, can you raise them up? Yeah, just keep. Keep them up there. Okay. So now the other ones will have black with the red. These were production, you know, test pieces here. They weren't, uh, well, here we go. We have red ones. There's the red, there's where the red ones went. <laughs> so they'll, they'll be marked for polarity. Okay. But uh, yeah, we had some samples there. And then but, someone asked if they could try uh, some XLRs. Yeah, uh, the XLRs and the like, you want to do the four by fours that are, those are the most optimized for analog because they use the four 30 gauges. Now, what did the 30 gauges do? Everybody should be able to answer me. Why did I use 30 gauge? We went through the whole thing, homework. I use 30 gauge to increase the resistance in that equation, right? Because I don't want to raise the capacitance that much because we have a voltage transfer function. So I want to keep the capacitance low for the voltage transfer function, but I also want to improve the VP linearity. So the frequencies going through the cable travel closer to the same speed. To do that, I had to raise resistance. The only way to trick it into thinking that it has higher resistance or higher resistance is to use four 30 gauges individually insulated from each other. And those four 30 gauges are actually in an air tube. They don't even have insulation around them. All right. And that's how I get the low cap, by the way is they're, they're basically uninsulated wires in that little X pillar. So now I've tricked it into having high resistance. I've tricked it into having a low dielectric constant. That way I can get low capacitance, but I get better VP linearity because it thinks they're 30 gauges with high resistance. But since I use four in parallel, the signal sees it as four 30 gauges in parallel, which is a 22 gauge, which actually has lower resistance loop than the single 25 gauge design. So that cable specifically made for analog, all right? And again, it was done on purpose. There was a specific reason that I learned doing all this over two years as to why none of this stuff was an accident. I know people think wiring cable is all a bunch of pirates, you know, some of the bitches. Now, the other thing too that we haven't discussed, we kind of like to make these more affordable. If you notice our prices aren't 15 grand, right? I mean, someone can buy our cables that have a modest 
stereo. I'd like to see a guy with a pair of Vandersteen trios and a nice amp and preamp or whatever be able to afford to buy good quality stuff and not go broke. Now, our pricing is such that the TPC product lines are absolutely unequivocally subsidized by the OFE and the SPTPC. Okay, so we've kind of made the margins on those a little higher because we know a guy that's buying our two grand speaker cable is getting a better product than a $15,000 competing product, and I really do feel that way. So he's still getting a good deal, but that lets the price of the TPC product line be low enough to where the entry level guy can buy truly well designed cables and have a nice setup. So we did that on purpose. All right. So if you look at our pricing, you'll see that it's not linear. But I'm telling you straight up, we did that on purpose for people that can't afford ultra expensive leads. And what's if you look the, at the, you know, what's the pricing on the ones that are going around, uh, I think a little over two for okay. a set. So again, we aren't asking hideous money. Mm -hmm. uh, now for the Belden, they're hideous money because the reason or two is when you work in a manufacturing environment and most people don't realize this, it's not the cost of materials you're using in the cable at all. What it is is how long it takes to make it and how much money Belden can make in the same amount of time making something else. So that's called standard allotted hours or square foot of plan efficiency, right? And they measure, our plan is measured by efficiency by our stockholders. How much money can we make as fast as we can make it? Well, if I go in there and say, you know, if you make $10,000 an hour making XYZ product, and I'm gonna come in with this really complicated product and you're gonna make one third as much cable, they're gonna say, you gotta price that in the same amount of time as I'm making, making that other product. So even though you're making one-tenth as much, you're going to have to price it 10 times higher because my plant efficiency numbers have to remain the same for my stockholders. So when you make small amounts of cable, the price goes up a lot. Yeah. So uh, in looking at your website, uh, I see you have a Belden power cable listed, but not Iconoclast power no. cable. Do you uh, now, how that came out, is measurement. I took a whole bunch of power cables that Belden makes and I measured them all. What I found is an EPDM dielectric, a high end industrial cable made out of EPDM, ethylene propylene diene monomer, which is a long word for synthetic rubber, had really good RF rejection properties, which is what we want in a good audio power cable. We don't want RF to move in and out of our cable. So we basically want something that's a crappy, dielectric except darn near at DC, which of course is what power is, is 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz. So we took that product, which has economies of scale. In other words, it already meets our stockholders standard allotted hours of production efficiency numbers. So we buy that bulk product and put on really good connectors. That's why we can sell that cable for such a good price uh, because we uh, took advantage of a product that already exists. The Iconoclast power cable, which will reduce inductance and hopefully have higher RF immunity is a whole unique design in and of itself that Belden would only make for us. So guess what the price is going to do? That $200 is going to go to $2,000, you guys. You know, there's no way around it because no one else, I can't sell that to anybody but us. So the volume is really low and it offsets production of other products in the plant. And that's how they price it. Basically, you, you got to pay for the amount of time you're using on the floor of a manufacturing plant. If you went to Ford and told them to make you a special car and it deploys 20 focuses, that car is going to cost as much as 20 focuses because that's the cost you displaced. That actually is more money than the value of the parts and the materials in the car. The bill of materials is actually only one-tenth the cost of making a product. So they don't, it is important, mind you, but it's the, the product production you displace that costs so darn much. So uh, again, that's why some of these cables are expensive. A lot of audiophiles don't understand why even when Belden makes it, why does it cost so much? I can't make this for 50 cents a foot when I'm displacing massive amounts of production. It takes 300 hours to make this cable. 300 hours to make 100 or 1,000 feet of polarity. Then I got to fold that polarity in two and I got half as much because I have to have two in a cable. So as this, you know, this is a polarity right here. And this is, like I said, this is 300 hours to make the bonded pair, twin it, cable it, you know, braid it, jacket it, extrude it, all that stuff. It takes a long time to make this product. It's very complex uh, to wind up with a nice cable product, but, you know, it's still far and away cheaper than anything on the market. And the sound quality, I think, eclipses anything out there for even, you know, 
five, 10 times the price. I really do feel that way. And uh, I feel justified in saying it because I know the numbers line up with what I think a good audio cable needs to do. And well, you need to figure out how to do this. And the designs, the designs don't come for free. The technology and the information does, but how you use it to make a good cable doesn't. You have to figure that out through just knowing what you're doing and being willing to take the time to do it. It's not easy. Like I said, it was two and a half years, really, to get to where I even had the Gen 2 finished. I have a Gen 2, you know, so to speak, iconoclast power cable, but I don't, right now, Blue Jeans is still paying for the cost to make the initial production of all the material. Blue Jeans isn't making any money on this yet at all, selling it. Because of the, the they're just jeans, now, blue, yeah, Blue Jeans cable buys the bulk from Belden. So we have bulk cable sitting there, but we haven't made enough. We haven't sold enough of the bulk we had to buy that the plant, because the plant will only make a minimum amount as well. So we have to order a minimum amount. And, you know, this is a new product line, right? So you don't make money the first day you sell one car. You only make money after you've sold 200 cars, let's say. So we're still on that paying for what we've done because we, it's a, we're a small group, you know, Two years may sound a long time, but in the scheme of things, the number of customers that is, you know, not really. I mean, so, but we, everybody really feels good about this product line and we feel like we're doing the right thing for the community and Bob and I are autophiles and Kurt is really into the tech of it, you know, and it's exciting and fun for him to sell something that's a little more techie and Kurt's all into it. He's a lawyer and he definitely understands just the facts, Jack. We ain't selling something that's not real. Uh, so hopefully with this presentation today that I've explained how I did it, why I did it, and that this stuff is definitely real. I mean, you can you can change how these cables work based on how you choose to design the variables. How you get there, every engineer has to figure that out. This is well, this has been really, really informative. And we've had most of the people on for almost three hours now that, that we started with. So that's a pretty good sign. You haven't lost very many people. Um, and I think we actually have more questions, but, but I, we have to wrap it up at some point. Can, I think, can people just email you their questions individually? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. what we've done, I'd answered some via email. Yeah. And you can email these and I can answer them and then can put them on your post kind yeah, of together. Yeah, we'll do that. So if everybody else has questions, we'll, I think, Larry, we can just send out your email address. Galen, no, there's, a lot, of, yeah, there's a lot more papers on the uh, Iconoclast website as well. So you can go out there and there'll be a bunch of stuff on the Iconoclast website that you can read as well. A bunch of tech information, what we did, why we did it. Uh, I don't know if uh, Frank is online still, but there'll be some issues in Copper Magazine, a series of articles also that kind of covers this uh, in more detail. And of course it's more tangible because it'll be in front of you in a Bolston and Copper Magazine so you can read it a little easier, uh, which I think some people are better with that. So okay. that'll be out. It looks like we've got an email address that was posted, bhowardiconoclastcable.com. Yeah, uh, G-G-A-R-E-I-S -G -G at iconoclastcable.com, uh-huh. Okay, and then, yeah, and then we'll try to, we can we can post the responses because we do, we've got so many we can't, we can't get to all of them. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, again, I mean, hopefully people are starting to see that this isn't really magic. There, there are reasons these cables do what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, if people are hoping that I have some pixie dust, I don't. There's nothing here that, and if I don't know something, I'll tell you. I don't know, honestly, why the EM field is changed by the copper grain structures or the draw science and the copper. You can hear it theoretically, at least what theory I think is there. You can't primarily because nobody's developed anything that's concretely provable that would account for how the grains affect the EM field phase properties. And that's what we hear is different. If we don't change the phase of the signal and how it's added up instantaneously with respect to time, that voltage amplitude can't change. So the sound doesn't change, but the minute we move something in phase left to right, when we add two signals or more, that changes the amplitude of that signal at that instant in time. And that changes the phase or what the music sounds like to us. So when we change cable, wire and we hear a difference that telling me somehow the phasing properties of how that EM field is comprised or superimposed one on top of the other is changing. Uh, but there's no good way to say anything you look at says it's too fast to be able to tell. Okay, yeah, Galen, listen. I want to make sure we get to this very important question. What kind of music do you listen to? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm kind of a, a junkyard dog. I eat anything. 
so to speak. My wife tries to figure me out with music. I could probably say I'm more folk music than say rock, but I still have my super tramp, you know, and I got my Peter, Paul and Mary and I love them both to death. Uh, I like Vivaldi. I like a little more rambunctious classical music. You know, I'll listen to Four Seasons at 100 dB, no sweat, you know, <laughs> things like that. So I like a little more energy to the music. My wife actually sings in an full orchestra. She did that for hobbies. So I go to the orchestra with her singing in the background uh, to say our audio systems sound like that. No, but you know something? My audio system, as far as the high frequency content and the imaging and that kind of thing, in some ways is, it's a fair trade to live music because it does things differently and it does things so much more personally. When you go to a full concert, the high frequencies, of course, roll off rather quickly when you're away from the stage. So you don't get quite as vivid a presentation as you do on your own personal hi-fi. It's like sitting in the best seat in the place all the time, every day, which is wonderful. That's uh, right. now, yeah, now I've been with her when no one's there because they're practicing. So I'll go sit right in the front so I can actually hear the highs and everything from the violins. But when I sit where I normally sit, I'm way back and all that stuff is vamoosed, you know, it's gone. So it's a lot more muffled sounding. And can you describe your system real quick? Yeah, I use a pair of uh, T plus A uh, monoblock amps. They're, uh, you know, they're high voltage amps. I use a pair of T plus A 1000-40 speakers. I use a Pass Labs uh, phono conditioner. I use a Pass Labs XP30. So I have an XP25 and an XP30. I use a VPI Class EQ term table. And I either use one or two cartridges, a Benz Ruby, Z, or I use a uh, Semico Blackbird. I use a PS Audio DAC and uh, memory player. I use all Belden Iconoclast cables, of course, with VAV power cords. I use a PA P20 power conditioner. And I also have a pair of CLX cable speakers and a Moon W8 uh, standard AB amp. So I got a bunch of stuff. I have two systems. The reason I have two systems is I have to determine how my cables behave on a kind of a difficult to run load, the CLXs. And then I have a more normal set of speakers, the T plus A hybrids. Okay, so I kind of put where my money where my mouth is for you guys to try to make sure I'm not doing you a disservice to how this stuff reacts. So I try to pick two polar extreme speaker systems so that uh, if I'm doing something really wrong, that's going to cause a problem for somebody. I want to know it and I don't want them to experience it. So I have two different systems I use this stuff on to make sure everything works. So that's why I have what I do.